thank you for tuning in. This is the 10th video of the Kufi is Real course book that we've been going to uh, through the last several months. Um, today, we're going to be discussing chapter 14, which is titled the Yom Kippur War and its aftermath. And then we'll be going over to lesson 15, which is very, very short. It's called New Conflict. Um, so feel free to follow along with us. If you do not have this book, visit kufi, C-U-F-I dot org. Um, you can purchase it. I believe it's $20. Um, the more you purchase, the bigger the discount. So if you're looking to do this with um, your school system, educational, whether you're homeschooled or want to present this as part of the curriculum um, to your public school, you definitely can. Um, anywhere, I would say elementary all the way through college level courses. Uh, you can also present this as a study group lesson with your church or with your synagogue, even if you're wanting to know how Christians, um, at least uh, Zionist Christians, view the land of Israel. And uh, yeah, it's really fantastic. We're going to jump into it on page 164 if you'd like to join us. Um, we do like to start out with prayer. And so it does ask us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem before uh, beginning this lesson, which is uh, bringing us um, Psalm 122, verse 6. Uh, Katie, do you happen to have your Bible with you if you want to read that scripture for us and say the prayer? Um, it literally just says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Um, I know that in the CJB and the TOJB 2011, it's Jerusalem, meaning more than one, two or one or more, or two or more, uh, plural being the heavenly Jerusalem and the earthly Jerusalem, that they have peace or shalom. And the root word for that is wholeness. So the have the Jerusalem above and the Jerusalem below have complete wholeness. We're praying in the will of God for Jerusalem uh, at the at the end of all, all the things, <laughs> you know. So that's what we're praying for, not just present day and future. Yes, yes, the Jerusalem above and the Jerusalem below. So Heavenly Father, we do go to your word and we stand on Psalm 122, as you've asked of verse six, that we pray for the peace, the wholeness, the perfect uh, peace, nothing missing, nothing broken for your city, Jerusalem, uh, the above and below, Father, and that it comes to complete wholeness in Jesus' name. Father, we ask that you open our eyes and our ears and our heart to the truth as we go through this course, each chapter by chapter, video by video, and we receive it as its intended um, uh, original meaning and way of getting to us that Israel is your land the tribe of Jacob is your people, and we as Christians are in covenant. They are our brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, who you are in covenant with. We are in covenant with because we have covenant with you, and we thank you for it. We lift your name high. We glorify you, Father. We bind any and all darkness from blindness, manipulation. Father, rid everyone's hearts and minds of any anger or hate that would blind them from the truth. Uh, misconceptions, anything like that, Father, and that just give us open ears and open hearts and open minds. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Awesome. So I'm going to start uh, again. This is page 164 of lesson 14. Um, it says, in our last lesson, we learned about the Six-Day War, a war of aggression against Israel by neighboring Arab states that resulted in a miraculous victory for Israel. The 1967 war was a seminal conflict in the history of modern Israel. Jerusalem was united under Jewish sovereignty for the first time since the Roman conquest of the Holy Land. Israel gained control over numerous key areas in the region, including the Gaza Strip, the Sinai Peninsula, the Golan Heights, and the area known commonly as the West Bank or Judea and Samaria, which is the biblical heartland and historic home of the Jewish people. In refusing to recognize Israel, make peace with Israel, or negotiate with Israel, the Arab states fostered Israel's administration of approximately 1.1 million Palestinian Arabs. The war was a humiliating defeat for the Arab armies, who had once again sworn to annihilate Israel. Egyptian leadership especially continued to nurse their resentment against the Jewish state. Israel, which had initially been lifted in spirit by their victory, was subject to terrorist attacks and continued threats of annihilation by Egypt. 
Now we're going to learn about the results of these threats of aggression by Egypt in the 1973 Yom Kippur War, which almost resulted in Israel's destruction. So part one, the surprise war. Buoyed by the miraculous victories won by the Six Day War, Israel's leaders were affected by a sense of invincibility and a false sense of security. Israel had technically been at war with Egypt and Syria, whose leaders had been present at the infamous Arab League conference in Khartoum, Sudan, at the Three No's, uh, or which the Three No's were agreed upon. That is, no peace with Israel, no recognition of Israel, and no negotiations with Israel. Sounds like a lovely bunch. Yet Israel's leaders did not anticipate the country's humiliated in the Six-Day War would attempt another altercation with the Jewish state so soon, just six years after their stunning defeat. I love whoever wrote this. Your words are uh, awesome. Meanwhile, Egyptian President Anwar Sadat cleverly put forward two ruses prior to the attack on Yom Kippur in 1973. He sent emissaries to the U.S. feigning interest in peace with Israel while simultaneously holding threatening military exercises near the Egypt-Israel border without actually attacking. Israel's Prime Minister, Golda Meir, though directly um, warned multiple times of an impending Egyptian attack against Israel by a formerly close confidant of Sadat, who became an Israel spy, um, Israeli spy, and even by King Hussein of Jordan, did not heed the warnings. Troops were not mobilized. On Saturday, October 6, 1973, the entire nation of Israel was quietly observing its holiest day of the year, including most of its soldiers. Catching the IDF unprepared, Egypt and Syria attacked Israel simultaneously on two fronts. And this doesn't, I mean, this is just repeating history on October 7th, uh, when they're observing a holy day. Oh, goodness. Okay. Less than 500 Israeli soldiers faced an overwhelming force of 600,000 Egyptians in the south, while in the north, 180 Israeli tanks defended against 1,400 Syrian tanks. Motivated by fears of an Arab victory backed by the Soviet Union, <clears throat> once again, on October 12th, U.S. President Richard Nixon authorized a massive emergency airlift of weapons to Israel. Though vastly outnumbered, Israel shocked the world by surviving the initial attacks and rallying to push the invaders back across the borders. 18 days after Egypt and Syria first attacked Israel, the Arab leaders agreed to a ceasefire rather than suffer further losses. Israel won the Yom Kippur War, war but 2,688 Israeli soldiers sacrificed their lives to protect the Jewish homeland. This next section is kind of in summary to what we just read called Let's Talk About It. Uh, four questions here to discuss, and I'll just start with number one and get your thoughts there, Katie. Um, what was the status of the relationships between Israel, Egypt, and Syria after 1967? Well, I first wanted to say uh, something that I we were just talking about before the video started. This Yom Kippur War and its importance when it says back in the first, um, it was a strategic and like, it was the first time that there was, Jerusalem was under Jewish sovereignty for the first time since the Roman conquest of the Holy Land. <laughs> yeah. uh, anyone who is arguing the fact that this war, previous wars, the current war that's going on, whose land it belongs to from a biblical standpoint should read Joshua chapter 15. This is after Moses has passed and he's given Joshua leadership over the uh, children of Israel and the land is being split up according to their inheritance. Joshua 15, especially um, verse 47, I'm reading out of the NASB. Um, it's giving all the border, the boundaries from all the mountains, the valleys, the lands and the seas and things like that. It says Ashdod and its towns and its villages, Gaza, its towns and its villages, as far as the brook of Egypt and the great sea, even its coastline. Then it goes on saying the, the uh, hills and things and the Golan Heights, everything that was uh, taken in the Six Day War uh, that we said here in the, what's that one, two, three, 
fourth, whatever it was, the Golan Heights and all these places. Mm -hmm. These are these are the promised land. This is the promised land of Israel back in uh, <laughs> from way back before Joshua, and then we see it in Joshua fifteen from a biblical standpoint. So read that that, and you'll see that they are taking what was already there anyways. But this was a forced um a forced takeover because they're protecting themselves from attack. So anyways, the status of the relationships between Israel, Israel, Egypt, and Syria after 1967 were obviously uh, tenuous at best. Um, they had the three no's for no peace, no recognition of them as even being a state, no ne negotiation with Israel whatsoever. Um, hostile. Hostile at most, tenuous at best. Mm -hmm. um, and nothing new. <laughs> right yeah it's like okay first you attack us you lost and now you won't um recognize our sovereignty that we beat your butts like <laughs> you don't get much choice when you're the, on the losing side exactly what, what makes you think you get to negotiate anything when you literally you tried to attack yeah. uh, surprisingly attack this wasn't like hey we're declaring war against you it was surprise attack um you got your butt beat and now you want to negotiate and say this and that. Uh, and then now, you you know, six years later, you still couldn't admit defeat. So here we go again, uh, trying to attack another time. Um, so, yeah, and like you said. Attacks on military versus military. This is military against civilians, men, women and children who have are living in peace in their homes and in their villages, farming their land, going to and from work there. It's nothing new. Mm -hmm. this is these are war crimes yeah not just an act of war this is an act of war but you're criminals like <laughs> yeah. you don't get a choice uh, that's mm -hmm. that's how I feel that when we talked about in the last video what what would you have done or what would you have you know you know it's all hindsight in 2020 but you don't attack men women and children who aren't in the military who aren't who are just civilians you don't get your butt beat and then you don't tell me what you're going to do about it mm -hmm. the land and everything that's under your control that person the winner's control at that point or the rightfully in control of it is the one who gets to decide the outcome of everything mm -hmm. that's just the way it, it is and the way it should be so yeah Especially if you're breaking rules of engagement, right? The whole reason we have rules of engagement are to protect civilian uh, and protect against civilian casualties. And for you to blatantly break, like just attack, like you said, civil, like civilians and in their homes and in their businesses and think that that's okay. No, you deserve to not only get your butt beat you know, I think you should deserve to get everything that you own taken away from you. Um, <laughs> you know, so yeah, not, not happy. It's a joke. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. And then what did president Sadat do to confuse world leaders about his intentions? Well, that's obvious over here, talking peace behind your back, uh, attacking. That's not new. That's a strategy that they've been, you know, doing for a hundred years, if not more than uh, the last hundred. Yeah. <laughs> so he sent eminent emissaries to the United States feigning interest with peace with Israel and while holding threatening military exercises near the Egyptian border without attacking. So he not only did that, he brought the United States into it and then lied to their faces. Mm -hmm. That is grounds for the United States for what they've done most times is to also beat them down into the dirt. <laughs> right to assist to Israel at least in any way they possibly can because Which they sent um, weapons an airlift of weapons mm -hmm. but yeah. oh yeah. dear God thank you and we pray for strong military uh, strong leaders <laughs> yes, we do. glory to God okay uh what did why did Prime Minister Mayor decide not to immobilize Israel's troops yeah i mean it, it doesn't really necessarily say um because it says though directly warned multiple times of an impending egyptian attack against israel by a formerly close confidant of sadat who became an israeli spy and even by king hussein of jordan they uh Goldemir did not heed the warnings um why 
I mean, I have my assumptions. I'm not pointing any fingers, but. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what was available, what was organized already, what. I mean, um, if there was no real organizational structure set up and forth, no pre-proposed plan for emergency services or emergency warnings or gatherings, if you put out that kind of warning, you're going to have chaos and fear ruling the minds of the people. Um, whereas if it was, if they had the structure in place, maybe I'm just spitballing here. But that that is the only logical thing that comes to my mind that says you don't rally the troops if you have no organizational rallying structure in place, you know? How do you pull people in? You don't want to pull them in mass. Maybe that's what they were waiting on. Um, you know, maybe maybe she didn't mobilize them because they were organizing themselves to be mobilized. You know what I mean? Well, let's talk about what just recently happened in October. Um, lots of supposed, um, well, and people, I've heard it said that the yeah. impending attack was known. But again, same situation, troops weren't mobilized. Um, warnings were not given out to, like you said, civilians saying, don't do this, do this, you know, stay in, don't be part in, you know, away from home, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but then I've also heard it said that, you know, they had no clue. And so that's kind of, you know, what everyone hopes to believe. Right. Um, but for for those who say that, no, people knew about it and people within the infrastructure of the government knew about it, too, and uh, did it purposely, you know, did not make any moves purposely. And so. I don't know what this situation was in <laughs> 1973. Um, but either way, when they're talking peace out one ear and they're poking the bear, um, you know, on the other side, uh, just mobilize the freaking troops. OK, put out the warnings. Um, it's not like the people haven't gone through this for the last hundred years, if not 2000 years, constantly having to uh, prepare against an attack of some kind. Like this is their life. Like um, one of the first Kufi summits that there was in San Antonio, there were bomb threats against it. And a lot of the Christians up and left and the Jews stayed. And, and I remember it was uh, asked of some of the Jewish uh, leaders, like, why did, why did you choose to stay for the summit? They're like, this is just a Tuesday where we're from like this. <laughs> Yeah. bomb threats you know whatever um so it does it does not hurt to warn and give advance notice and it doesn't hurt to stick as many people up there as you possibly need to thwart an attack no matter uh, the size but um what they say 500 500 israeli soldiers versus 600,000 egyptians <laughs> like yeah it, it was god Absolutely, 100% God that only 2,688 Israelis lost their lives because it could have been hundreds of thousands more um, in that situation. So, yeah. The other thing is when you were speaking brought two things to mind. I'm not, uh, I am not clear whatsoever on how the Knesset, the prime minister and the president of Israel is formed. I'm not sure about their government. But where ours is the chief commander in chief, I don't know if they have the same things too. So was there a vote needed? Did everyone have to come to an agreement before troops could be mobilized? And two, within that, there are always people in the government that are on the opposite side. Mm -hmm. So what was their organizational structure as that? I don't know. And they know, I'm sure somebody knows. And two, there's always someone working against you against the greater good that could also be a possibility now that is from a completely blind on this side of the wall <laughs> peeking over thinking about possibilities but as you were talking about that those two things popped up one did they have to vote two one was the structure there two did they have to vote before she can you know work her hands tied and and two there's always someone working against you mm-hmm yeah, exactly. So you know, that the information was not only from the credible source, but the the capabilities credible as well. Mm -hmm. so.
things yeah. we don't leaders that's why leaders are leaders and they don't tell us everything there's a lot more into it than they want to explain to the whole or like whole nations yeah them. to to people like us just you yeah, know there's civilians no blame. there's no blame there's just a lack of understanding and knowledge somewhere so yeah god knows <laughs> why was this so challenging well on sat i was on one of their police days they were doing what they were doing including celebrating with their family you know definitely not garbed out with their military apparel and you know having their you know firearms on their you know hip or over their shoulder mm-hmm. Yeah, this is kind of like it. Aren't there holy days like kind of like Shabbat type things? Like you prep, you prepare before, and then the day you just enjoy and you rest and you celebrate and and things like that. So they're, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, because uh, you have. I mean, if everyone's at their home celebrating with their family, then they have to hear what's going on, get to their meeting place you know whether it's a base or wherever check in and then get commands to go here or there that's a lot of time wasted had they already been where they needed to be to help block or to prevent that attack um with the knowledge that hey i'm gonna have to jump i get my go bag with me it's in the car so if i need to go i know exactly where i'm going and i already have what i need with me to get there um that would have been so much better than like, oh, what's happening? I'm with my family. Oh, I need to get here, you know, and then trying to to figure out, you know, where you're going to be stationed or placed or whatnot. So, yeah. and then they were attacked uh, on two fronts. And as you said, 500 against 600,000 and then 180 mm-hmm. against 1400 mm-hmm. on the tanks part two. So, yeah. Yeah. So now we can play the Yom Kippur War, how Israel turned the tide. Is that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. I'm going to share that real quick. And that should be a short, I believe, um, micro history, but let's find out. After the Yom Kippur War broke out on October 6, 1973, Israel quickly felt a noose tighten around its neck. Outnumbered and unprepared, Israel incurred unexpected heavy losses in the first three days. The Egyptians pushed into the Sinai and the Syrians conquered the Golan Heights, closing in on Israel's population centers. Make no mistake, the possibility of Israel losing the war was becoming increasingly real by the hour. Losing the war would likely spell the end of Israel. So how did Israel turn the tide and stave off the greatest existential threat it had faced since its war of independence? In choosing not to strike first, like Israel had done successfully in 1967, an uncertain Golda had relied on the advice of Defense Minister Moshe Dayan and many of her high-ranking military advisors. But when the fighting began, it was they who turned to Golda. After the initial shock of the Egyptian-Syrian onslaught, Golda became a rock. Despite Israeli losses, and before Golda really had gathered her own strength, she still put on a strong appearance for the worried Israeli public. She delivered a calm, measured radio address to the citizens of Israel at the end of the first day of fighting, affirming her confidence in the IDF. Golda not only reassured the public, but galvanized the leadership into action. She was called upon to make key strategic military decisions, which she had never thought to be her strength. But her spur-of-the-moment decisions would lead to some of Israel's greatest achievements in the war. Still, some in her cabinet, like Dayan, were shrouded in despair, believing defeat was imminent. Golda also maintained dialogue with an important frenemy in the region, the Jordanians. Now, Jordan's King Hussein was wary of getting involved in the Yom Kippur War from the get-go, even warning the Israelis ahead of the coordinated Egyptian-Syrian surprise attack in the hopes that Israel could take preemptive action and end the war before it ever began, a la 1967. King Hussein didn't want Jordan to suffer losses like it did in the Six-Day War. On the other hand, he couldn't afford to be viewed by the other Arab nations as disloyal or unwilling to take up arms against Israel, which would make Jordan into a pariah. So through back channels, Golda and King Hussein came to an understanding of sorts that neither side would do much damage to the other. But let's get back to the key players, Egypt and Syria. With the two Arab countries receiving arms from the Soviet Union, Golda turns to Israel's superpower friend, the United States, in hopes of resupplying the staggering losses the IDF had suffered. Now, why didn't the US have Israel's back right away? Well, US Secretary of State Henry Kissinger had his own diplomatic agenda. In his words, The best result would be if Israel came out a little ahead, but bloodied in the process and the U.S. stayed clean. 
He felt secure that Israel could turn things around on their own and wanted to avoid triggering a Soviet resupply effort of the Arabs. At the same time, by delaying U.S. aid and allowing the Israelis to suffer losses on their way to eventual victory, the U.S. would avoid totally alienating the Arabs. This, Kissinger hoped, could ultimately help him catch the Great White Whale, a permanent Middle East peace plan negotiated by Kissinger himself in which both Israel and the Arab states would land on America's side of the Cold War. But once the Soviets began resupplying the Arabs with planes, tanks, and weapons by sea to make up for early Arab losses, Kissinger and President Nixon's calculations changed. The US wasn't going to sit idly by and watch Soviet allies who were making surprising headway take control of the Middle East by pushing out Israel, America's key strategic ally in the region. Nixon, sensing Israel was really up against a wall, also feared what might happen if Golda turned to her last resort. What if, seeing all hope lost, the Israelis went nuclear? The morning of October 9th, Nixon and Kissinger learned that Israel had begun to prepare its nuclear weapons for action. Golda knew that if she made Israel's preparations easily detectable, the US would get the message. And they did. With nuclear tensions between the US and the Soviets already at an all-time high, the US wasn't crazy about the idea of starting World War III in the Middle East. So on October 12th, nearly a week into the war, Nixon ordered the military to prepare a massive shipment of arms and supplies to Israel. This would come to be known as Operation Nickelgrass. Getting wind of the plan, Arab nations quickly threatened oil embargoes on any European countries willing to allow American aircraft to land for refueling or fly over their territory. Most of them caved to the oil-rich Arab countries and banned American planes from their airspace. Portugal was the lone exception, and within a few days, 22,000 tons of weapons and supplies began pouring into Israel with stopovers in Portugal. American planes flew round the clock, completing over 500 flights. They brought over tanks, helicopters, fighter jets, replacing early Israeli losses, and then some. Now, days before Operation Nickelgrass began, Israeli tanks in the north had largely pushed out the Syrians, recapturing the rocky Golan Heights. On October 14th, with new supplies now flowing in, Israeli tanks pushed back against Egypt on the sands of the Sinai. By the late afternoon, that same day, Israel had routed the Egyptians. By the next night, Israel crossed the Suez Canal and soon encircled Egypt's third army. The Israelis then set their sights on the Egyptian capital of Cairo, roughly 60 miles away. By October 22nd, two weeks into the war, Israel's reversal of fortune was pretty much complete. Israeli forces had recaptured Mount Hermon in the north and pushed on until they were only 25 miles from Damascus, the Syrian capital. That same day, the United Nations called for an immediate ceasefire, but the fighting didn't stop as both sides refused to let down their guard. The Soviets threatened to send in their own troops to defend the Egyptian Third Army, which was still encircled by the Israelis. The Soviets also put their warplanes on high alert to defend the Egyptian and Syrian capitals in the event of attack. In response, Kissinger warned that if the Soviets sent forces to the Middle East, the United States would as well. This was the closest the Soviets and the Americans had come to direct military confrontation since the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. The Soviets backed down and Moscow asked Washington to make sure the Israelis eased up on Egypt's third army so as not to humiliate Egyptian President Anwar Sadat. The Americans also made sure Israel stopped its advance on Cairo to preserve the possibility of peace with Egypt. Remember, Sadat came into this war hoping to regain Egypt's national dignity and honor that took such a hit after the 1967 Six-Day War. Only then would Sadat enter peace negotiations. On October 28th, the fighting officially ended, when the first direct talks between Egypt and Israel began. Israeli Major General Aaron Yariv and Egyptian Major General Mohamed El Gamasi shook hands and began negotiating. During the talks, some Egyptian and Israeli soldiers actually emerged from their camps and began meeting daily to brew coffee, play backgammon and soccer, and show off photos of wives and girlfriends. These relations were pretty astounding, not just because of the bloody war that preceded them, but because despite the ceasefire, some of these soldiers were still periodically shooting at each other in the evening. Now, it would appear Israel won the war, especially considering the numbers, right? In total, Arab casualties have been estimated at over 8,000 dead and over 19,000 wounded, though some estimate twice that. The Egyptians took the worst of it. The Israelis, on the other hand, lost 2,656 soldiers with another 7,250 wounded. Yes, that's far fewer than the Arabs, but that's also triple the casualties Israel saw in the 1967 Six-Day War. And in that war, Israel secured a lightning-quick victory, tripling its landmass. While in this war, the Israelis were run ragged. Still, Israel's military showed outstanding resiliency in staging an epic comeback after such a disastrous start to the war. The IDF excelled in some of the biggest tank battles the world had ever seen. Israel also learned just how important its friendship with the US was. 
Ultimately, the US was the only ally that really showed up for the Jewish state in its hour of need. Now, even though it's pretty clear Israel won militarily, that's not the whole story. Politically, Egypt also secured a huge win, putting Israel on the brink of collapse, forcing them to call upon the United States to come to their rescue, and uniting Arab nations throughout the region to join the fight was a major win for Sadat. Egyptians no longer felt the humiliation of 1967 and proved the IDF wasn't invincible. And in the post-war negotiations a few years later, Israel began the process of handing the Sinai back over to Egypt. So basically, Egypt scored a huge victory in terms of morale and territory. And in Israel, it certainly didn't feel like a victory. Remember, Israel lost nearly 3,000 soldiers, with more than 7,000 wounded. For a tiny country of only 3 million, well, think of it like this. Pretty much everyone in Israel either lost someone close to them or knew someone who did. But seeing Israel's democracy on display after the war was truly inspiring. By definition, a democracy is predicated on holding those in power accountable, and that's exactly what happened in Israel following the Yom Kippur War. Many Israelis didn't see Golda as a strong leader who showed resolve. They saw a deer in headlights and viewed her and Dayan as responsible for Israel's lack of preparedness. Moti Ashkenazi, an IDF reserve captain, held up a sign in front of Golda's residence that read, Grandma, your defense minister is a failure and 3,000 of your grandchildren are dead. A government inquiry known as the Agronaut Commission found that Golda and Dayan weren't directly responsible for any wrongdoing. Most of the blame was placed on senior IDF intelligence officers. But still, in the face of growing national frustration, the ruling Labor Party fractured and Golda eventually resigned. In the end, Israel withstood the attack, but the Arabs proved the IDF wasn't an indestructible force. While still an icon, much of Golda's legacy is now defined by the failures surrounding the war. The period also showed that even military heroes like Dayan aren't immune from the stresses and devastation of war. Still, ironically enough, the war sparked peace negotiations between Israel and Egypt, leading to one of the strongest and longest standing peace treaties in an unstable region like the Middle East. Thanks for watching. See you guys next week. All right, so we just heard uh, some more information that uh, is unfolding with what happened with the Yom Kippur war um, from beginning to middle what happened you know what started how did leadership react and then the end results so pretty amazing um, I'm going to continue reading on uh, page 166 and then it's going to have us read um, an address by President Anwar Sadat to the Knesset um, so page 166 if you're following along in the book it says, uh, this is under part two, titled Peace with Egypt. One of the core results of the 1973 Yom Kippur War was the peace agreement that was signed between Egypt and Israel several years later. But how did the two states, which had feuded for more than 20 years, reach an, reach an agreement? Let's find out. On November 19, 1977, the Egyptian President Anwar Sadat landed in Israel the first ever official visit to the Jewish state by an Arab leader. Amazingly, the trip had been arranged less than one week prior. At this time, the U.S. had been trying without success to arrange a peace conference in Switzerland. But Sadat shocked the world when he told American anchor Walter Conkright publicly that he'd like to head to Israel as early as possible when invited formally. For years, he had been making small gestures indicating he might be interested in peace with the Jewish state. Even more surprisingly, Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin took the statement seriously and said he would personally go to meet Sadat at the airport, inviting Sadat over a radio interview with Concrete and making an appeal for peace to the Egyptian people. The rest is history. Sadat's now famous speech to the Knesset served as the beginning of a 16-month long process leading to the signing of a peace treaty. Israel and Egypt have now enjoyed over 40 years of peace. As the first Arab leader to publicly acknowledge Israel's sovereignty and to engage with it in serious dialogue, Sadat was a trailblazer who forever changed the face of the Middle East. Let's take a few moments to look at the text of his landmark address. So uh, it does say refer to the excerpts from the address by President Anwar Sadat to the Knesset found at the end of this lesson. Uh, review the document and pick one of the following questions to discuss with a study buddy or reflect on in a journal entry. All right, so I'm going to page 169 uh, to where this address is. 
Now it does say uh, this address was made to the Israeli Knesset on November 20th, 1977. In the name of God, the gracious and merciful, Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen, I come to you today on solid ground to shape a new life, to establish peace. We all on this land, the land of God, we all Muslims, Christians, and Jews worship God and no one but God. God's teachings and commandments are love, sincerity, purity, and peace. I do not blame all those who received my decision when I announced it to the entire world before the Egyptian people's assembly with surprise and amazement. Some gripped by the violent surprise believe that my decision was no more than verbal juggling to cater for world public opinion. Others still interpret it as political tactics to camouflage my intention of launching a new war. Wouldn't be surprising. I would go as far as to tell you that one of my aides at the presidential office contacted me at a late hour following my return home from the People's Assembly and sounded worried as he asked me, Mr. President, what would be uh, our reaction if Israel should actually extend an invitation to you? I replied calmly, I will accept it immediately. I have declared that I will go to the end of the world. I will go to Israel for I want to put before the people of Israel all the facts. I can see the point of all of those who were astounded by my decision or those who had any doubts as to the sincerity of the intentions behind the declaration of my decision. No one would have ever conceived that the president of the biggest Arab state, which bears the heaviest burden at the top responsibility pertaining to the cause of war and peace in the Middle East, could declare his readiness to go to the land of the adversary while we were still in a state of war. Rather, we all are still bearing the consequences of four fierce wars waged within 30 years. The families of the 1973 October War are still moaning under the cruel pains of widowhood and bereavement of sons, fathers, and brothers. As I have already declared, I have not consulted as far as this decision is concerned with any of my colleagues and brothers, the Arab heads of state, or the confrontation states. Those of them who contacted me following the declaration of this decision expressed their objection because the feeling of utter suspicion and absolute lack of confidence between the Arab states and the Palestinian people on the one hand and Israel on the other still surges in us all. It is sufficient to say that many months in which peace could have been brought about has been wasted over differences and fruitless discussions on the procedure for the convocation of the Geneva Conference, all showing utter suspicion and absolute lack of confidence. But to be absolutely frank with you, I took this decision after long thinking, knowing that it con constitutes a grave risk for, if God Almighty has made it my fate, to assume the responsibility on behalf of the Egyptian people and to share in the fate determining responsibility of the Arab nation and the Palestinian people. The main duty dictated by this responsibility is to exhaust all and every means in a bid to save my Egyptian Arab people and the entire Arab nation, the horrors of new shock shocking and destructive wars, the dimensions of which are foreseen by no other than God himself. I'm going to make a note to come back to that statement right there. <laughs> After long thinking, I convinced, I was convinced that the obligation of responsibility before God and before the people make it incumbent on me that I should go to the farthest corner of the world, even to Jerusalem, to address the members of the Knesset, the represent representatives of the people of Israel, and acquaint them with all the facts surging in me. Then I would leave you to decide for yourselves. Following this, may God Almighty determine our fate. If I said that I wanted to save all the Arab people the horrors of shocking and destructive wars, I most certainly declare before you that I have the same feelings and bear the same responsibility towards all and every man on earth and certainly towards the Israeli people. Any life lost in war is a human life, irrespective of it being of that of an Israeli or an Arab. A wife who becomes a widow is a human being entitled to a happy family life, whether she be an Arab or an Israeli. Innocent children who are deprived of the care of and compassion of their parents are ours, but be they living on Arab or Israeli land. They command our top responsibility to afford them a comfortable life today and tomorrow. For the sake of them all, for the safeguard of the lives of all our sons and brothers, 
for affording our communities an opportunity to work for the progress and happiness of man and his right to a dignified life, for our responsibilities before the generations to come, for a smile on the face of every child born on our land. For all that, I have taken my decision to come to you despite all hazards. To deliver my address, I have shouldered the prerequisites of the historical responsibility, and therefore I declared on the 4th of February, 1971, to be precise, that I was willing to sign a peace agreement with Israel. This was the first declaration made by a responsible Arab official since the outbreak of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Motivated by all these factors dictated by the responsibilities of leadership, I called on the 16th of October, 1973, before the Egyptian People's Assembly for an international conference to establish permanent peace based on justice. I was not in the position of he who is pleading for peace or asking for a ceasefire. Motivated by all these factors dictated by duties of history and leadership, we signed the first disengagement agreement, following by the second disengagement agreement in Sinai. Then we proceeded trying both open and closed doors in a bid to find a certain path leading to a durable and just peace. We opened our hearts to the peoples of the entire world to make them understand our motivations and objectives, and to leave them actually convinced of the fact that we are advocates of justice and peacemakers. Motivated by all these factors, I decided to come to you with an open mind and an open heart and with a conscious determination so that we might establish permanent peace based on justice. In the light of these facts, which I meant to place before you the way I see them, I would also wish to warn you in all sincerity, I warn you against some thoughts that could cross your mind. Minds, frankness makes it incumbent upon me to tell you the following. First, I have not come here for a separate agreement between Israel and Egypt. This is not part of the policy of Egypt. The problem is not that of Egypt and Israel. Any separate peace between Egypt and Israel or between any Arab confrontation state and Israel will not bring permanent. Let me read that again. <laughs> First, I have not come here for a separate agreement between Egypt and Israel. This is not part of the policy of Egypt. The problem is not that of Egypt and Israel. Any separate peace between Egypt and Israel or between any Arab confrontation state and Israel will not bring permanent peace based on justice in the entire region. Rather, even if peace between all the confrontation states and Israel were achieved, in the absence of a just solution to the Palestinian problem will never Never will be, no, never will there be that durable and just peace upon which the entire world insists today. Solution to the Palestinian problem, keywords. Second, I have not come to you to seek a partial peace, namely to terminate the stage of belligerency at this stage and to put off the entire problem to a subsequent stage. This is not the radical solution that would steer us to permanent peace. Equally, I have not come to you for a third disengagement agreement in Sinai or in the Golan and in the West Bank, for this would mean that we are merely delaying the ignition of the fuse. It would mean that we are lacking the courage to confront peace, that we are too weak to shoulder the burdens and responsibilities of a durable peace based on justice. I have come to you so that together we might build a durable peace based on justice to avoid the shedding of one single drop of blood from an Arab or an Israeli. It is for this reason that I have proclaimed my readiness to go to the farthest corner of the world. Here, he's saying that multiple times and I'm going to put a star there too. Here, I would go back to the answer to the big question. How can we achieve a durable peace based on justice? In my opinion, and I declare it to the whole world from this forum, the answer is neither difficult nor impossible, despite long years of feud, blood vengeance, spite, and hatred, and breeding generations on con concepts of total rift and deep-rooted animosity. The answer is not difficult, nor is it impossible if we sincerely and faithfully follow a straight line. You want to live with us in this part of the world, and all sincerity, I tell you, we welcome you among us with full, full security and safety. This in itself is a tremendous turning point, one of the landmarks of a decisive historical change. 
We used to reject you. We had our reasons and our claims. Yes. We used to brand you as so-called Israel. Yes. We were together in international conferences and organizations and our representatives did not and still do not exchange greetings. Yes. This has happened and is still happening. It is also true that we used to set as a precondition for any negotiations with you, a mediator who would meet separately with each party. Through this procedure, the talks of the first and second disengagement agreements took place. Our delegates met in the first Geneva conference without exchanging a direct word. Yes, this has happened. Yet today I tell you and declare to the whole world that we accept to live with you in permanent peace based on justice. We do not want to encircle you or be encircled ourselves by destructive missiles ready for launching, nor by the shells of grudges and hatred. I, an, I have announced on more than one occasion that Israel has become a fait accompli, recognized by the world, and that the two superpowers have undertaken the responsibility of its security and the defense of its existence. As we truly, as we really and truly seek peace, we really and truly welcome you to live among us in peace and security. Allow me to address my call from this rostrum of the people of Israel. I address myself with true and sincere words to every man, woman, and child in Israel. From the Egyptian people who bless the sacred mission of peace, I convey to you the message of peace, the message of the Egyptian people who do not know fanaticism and whose sons, Muslims, Christians, and Jews live together in a spirit of cordiality, love, and tolerance. This is Egypt, whose people have entrusted me with that sacred message, the message of security, safety, and peace. To every man, woman, and child in Israel, I say, encourage your leadership to struggle for peace. Let all endeavors be channeled towards building a huge edifice for peace instead of strongholds and hideouts defended by destructive rockets. Introduce to the entire world the image of the new man in this era so that he might set an example to the man of our age, the man of peace everywhere. Be the heralds to your sons. Tell them that past wars were the last of the wars, uh, were the last of wars and the end of sorrows. Tell them that we are in for a new beginning. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Tell them that we are in for a new beginning to a new life, the life of love, prosperity, freedom, and peace. You bewailing mother, you widowed wife, you the son who lost a brother or a father, you all victims of war. Fill the earth and space with recitals of peace. Fill bosoms and hearts with aspirations of peace. Turn the song into a reality that blossoms and lives. Make hope a code of conduct and endeavor. The will of peoples is part of the will of God. And I have chosen this difficult ro road, which is considered, in the opinion of many, the most difficult road. I have chosen to come to you with an open heart and an open mind. I have chosen to give this great impetus to the international efforts exerted for peace. I have chosen to present to you and in your own home the realities devoid of any schemes or whims, not to maneuver or to win a round, but for us to win together. The most dangerous of rounds and battles in modern history, the battle of permanent peace based on justice. It is not my battle alone, nor it is the battle of the leadership in Israel alone. It is the battle of all and every citizen in all our territories whose right it is to live in peace. It is the commitment of conscience and responsibility in the hearts of millions. When I put forward this initiative, many asked, what, it, what is it that I conceived as possible to achieve during this visit and what my expectations were? And as I answered the questioners, I announced before you that I have not thought of carrying out this initiative from the concept of what could be achieved during the visit, but what I have come here to deliver, that I, but I have come here to deliver a message. I have delivered the message and may God be my witness. I repeat with Zachariah, love, right, and justice. Hey guys, I'm Jacob, and today we're gonna to talk about one of the first women to lead any nation in the modern era, Israel's first female prime minister, and hopefully not its last, Golda Meir. Now, next to Moshe Dayan's eye patch and Ben-Gurion's frizzy hair, Golda is one of Israel's most famous icons. She's revered as Israel's founding grandmother and left behind a legacy as a sharp, fearless leader and passionate fighter for social justice. But is Golda's legacy all that accurate? To some of her critics, she's remembered as a sort of failure, a leader who didn't do enough to address racial tensions in Israel and whose government's headstrong arrogance was responsible for the devastating losses of the 1973 Yom Kippur War. This seems a bit oversimplistic. She's been called many things, a feminist, a fierce traditionalist, an atheist, and a socialist. 
but there's one thing she was never called, weak. So who was Golda Meir and what made her tick? As a child in Russia at the turn of the century, Golda experienced firsthand the terrifying mob attacks and lynchings of Jews known as the pogroms. At eight years old, Golda's family fled Russia and settled in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, the land of American cheese. Her parents didn't want her to attend high school, but Golda was one stubborn kid, so she ran away from home and moved in with her older sister Shana, a staunch Zionist. Her sister held parlor meetings at home where Jewish intellectuals would come and discuss ideas of socialism and Zionism, and teenage Golda would drink in every word. At age 17, she joined the Marxist Zionist workers group Paulation, and her lifelong career in Zionism began. Now, if you had to describe Golda's approach to her life and career in three words, it would be get stuff done. Whatever the job, she rolled up her sleeves and went at it. She felt that she couldn't accomplish as much as she wanted to for Zionism in the US, so in 1921, at age 23, she and her husband Morris immigrated to pre-Israel Palestine. Or rather, Golda immigrated to pre-Israel Palestine and dragged Morris along with her. They moved to kibbutz where Golda proved she was not the soft American girl the kibbutzniks assumed her to be, and she was soon chosen as the kibbutz representative to the labor union, rising through the ranks and eventually joining the Jewish agency, the quasi-government of the Jewish people in pre-state Israel. To really understand Golda, you have to focus on one of the defining moments of her career, the 1938 Evian Conference in a gorgeous commune in southeastern France. It may sound like a relaxing spa retreat, but it was anything but. U.S. President FDR convened a meeting of 32 countries to agree on a plan to accept the thousands of Jewish refugees fleeing Nazi Germany. The agreement they reached was that none of them would accept any additional refugees. That included the U.S., which was under internal political pressure to put America first, leaving the Jews to fend for themselves. Attending the conference as an observer for the Jewish community of the British Mandate of Palestine, but not allowed to speak, Golda watched in horror and frustration as world leaders tacitly sent the message to Hitler We've got enough Jews, and you should figure out what to do with them yourself. This traumatizing experience would influence many of her decisions later on in life. The worldview she developed could be summed up with the Hebrew motto, Ein Brera. Literally, it translates as, there's no other option. But a better definition would be, you better take care of stuff yourself because no one else is going to do it for you. Meir put this motto to use in 1948 when she insisted Ben-Gurion send her to America to raise funds for the Israeli War of Independence. The Jewish agency doubted she would raise the five million they needed, and in the end, they were right. Because she came back with $50 million cash packed in suitcases in one and five dollar bills. Imagine getting that past TSA today. Ben-Gurion later said that the money she raised was responsible for the victory and establishment of the State of Israel. In 1949, the year following the establishment of the state, she took on the job of Minister of Labor, overseeing tremendous growth in housing and immigration, creating a revolutionary national healthcare system, and essentially establishing the welfare state. This was a huge deal, considering that Israel started off with virtually no infrastructure in place for its growing population. In 1956, Ben-Gurion appointed her foreign minister. As foreign minister, Golda admired how the newly emerging African states seemingly aligned with her motto of getting things done on their own. She announced, like us, their freedom was won only after years of struggle. Like us, they had to fight for their statehood. And like us, nobody handed them their sovereignty on a silver platter. She also felt a kinship with the Africans who had endured centuries long suffering, but pushed through it all. So she decided she was done sitting and watching them suffer and she wanted to do something about it. She started a bold new initiative to send hundreds of Israeli experts to Africa to share their technical, agricultural, and other know-how with these new states. And her plan succeeded at first. Young, tiny Israel helped promote the development of many African countries. But it all fell apart when the Yom Kippur War broke out, which we'll get to in a minute, when the African states cut ties with Israel, labeling it a pariah. Talk about a fall from grace. But Golda's efforts in Africa raise another question. Was she really such a promoter of equality? Well, not always. In the 50s, Israel rushed to absorb Jewish immigrants from North Africa and the Middle East, known as Mizrahim, who soon became more than half of Israel's population. But there was a massive culture clash and some serious social inequalities came up. Later, as prime minister, Golda made some attempts to bridge the divide, but many people in the Mizrahi community felt like she didn't show the same sense of social justice as she did with the African countries when dealing with the inequity experienced by the Mizrahi. This led to the rise of the civil rights group called the Israel Black Panthers in 1971, named after the American Black Panthers. During one protest of 7,000 people, they hung an effigy of Golda chanting, a state in which half the population are kings and the other half are treated as slaves, we will burn it down. To some, Golda's culturally elitist attitude towards the Mizrahi plight 
proved that she and the rest of the Ashkenazi leadership were out of touch and dismissive. Sadly, unlike her efforts in Africa, this was not an example of Golda the social activist taking action. But the most traumatizing event of Golda's career, and for the nation as a whole, was the Yom Kippur War. On October 6, 1973, while Jews throughout Israel sat in synagogue and fasted during Yom Kippur services, the armies of Egypt and Syria launched a surprise attack on Israel. Now, there's intense debate around the question of how Golda performed during the Yom Kippur War and who bared the blame for the ensuing fiasco. To some, she totally dropped the ball. She and her advisors had plenty of warning that Syria and Egypt were about to attack from the north and the south. Egyptian troops and tanks gathering on the border? Nah, it's just an exercise. A high-placed Egyptian source, Nasser's own son-in-law, warning Israel that an attack is imminent? Nope, they wouldn't dare. The King of Jordan meeting with the presidents of Egypt and Syria, and then secretly flying to Israel to warn Golda to her face that they were about to attack? No thanks, we're good. Golda's military advisor just could not imagine that the Arab states would attack Israel after their crushing defeat in the Six-Day War of 1967. After all, who would want to embarrass themselves like that again? Israeli intelligence assumed the Egyptians could never cross the Suez Canal and that they wouldn't dream of launching a war they couldn't ultimately win. But it turned out that the Egyptians and Syrians didn't share those assumptions. Who knew? Golda, like the rest of Israeli leadership, bought into this superiority complex. But six hours before the attack, when Golda and her team finally woke up and realized that war might be imminent, she ordered a full mobilization of the army. Talk about waiting until the last minute. IDF chief David Elazar wanted to launch a preemptive strike. Golda, whose instinct had always been to strike first, was self-admittedly not all that knowledgeable about military affairs, and Defense Minister Moshe Dayan and Intelligence Chief Ali Zaira persuaded her that Egypt and Syria were not about to start a war. They were also concerned that by attacking first, they'd look like the aggressor and would lose the support of the US. So instead of following her gut, she listened to her military advisors. Until her dying day, she regretted not having insisted on taking action. The first two days of the war shattered Israel's sense of invincibility. Golda, devastated by Israel's major losses, even contemplated suicide. But she forced herself through the despair and got back in the driver's seat, smoking 90 cigarettes a day, fueled by dozens of cups of Turkish black coffee, on no food or sleep, and at 75 years old, she led the war effort with focus, strength, and confidence, earning her nickname the Israeli Iron Lady. Golda and the IDF turned the tables, and by the war's end, Israel had recaptured the territory it had lost, and then some. So you could view this war as an Israeli victory, if not for the impact on Israel's national morale and the tremendous loss of life. After the war, the Israeli people wanted to know who to blame for things going so horribly wrong. So a committee was formed. The Agronaut Commission cleared Golda of direct responsibility and even praised her for acting wisely with common sense and speed. Still, public opinion against Golda was strong. Her approval rating, once as high as 90, was now down to 20. Yikes. Within a month, she resigned. She said, it doesn't matter what logic dictated, it matters only what I, who was so accustomed to making decisions, who did make them throughout the war, failed to make that one decision. In Golda's mind, her greatest mistake was when she failed to live by her motto of taking action. So how should Golda Meir be remembered? How could one of Israel's most popular prime ministers also be one of the most scorned? Was she a hero or a failure? And does a leader have to be one or the other? Drop your comments and questions below and don't forget to subscribe. See you next time. It was Saturday, October 6th, 1973 in Israel. The country was quiet and focused on observing the holiest day on the Jewish calendar. Suddenly, the somber, holy atmosphere was shattered. Catching the IDF unaware while many soldiers observed Yom Kippur, Egypt and Syria attacked Israel simultaneously on two fronts. Less than 500 Israeli soldiers faced an overwhelming force of 600,000 Egyptians in the south, while in the north, 180 Israeli tanks defended against 1,400 Syrian tanks. Motivated by fears of an Arab victory backed by the Soviet Union, on October 12th, U.S. President Richard Nixon authorized a massive emergency airlift of weapons to Israel. Though vastly outnumbered, Israel shocked the world by surviving the initial attacks and rallying to push the invaders back across the borders. 
18 days after Egypt and Syria first attacked Israel, the Arab leaders agreed to a ceasefire rather than suffer further losses. Israel won the Yom Kippur War, but 2,688 Israeli soldiers sacrificed their lives to protect the Jewish homeland. Egyptian President Anwar Sadat shocked and angered the Arab world by standing in the Knesset in 1977 and declaring that he sought peace between Egypt and Israel. The next year, Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin and President Sadat met repeatedly in the United States for the historic Camp David Accords. Finally, a peace treaty between Egypt and Israel was signed on March 26, 1979. Menachem Begin agreed to return to Egypt 91% of the territory Israel had won in the Six-Day War and willingly gave up the strategic and economic benefits of the Sinai Peninsula. The sacrifices were painful, but peace with Egypt was the first step in achieving the peace and security Israel's people had sought for decades. Okay. So we just got finished watching more about Golda Meir. We uh, watched the Kufi micro history of um, the Yom Kippur War and then the Camp David Accords micro history. So what stood out to you on any one of those videos or all three videos? That Golda Meir made one decision not to go to war immediately. But out of all the things, that was what she was what most known for or still remembered for and the, the casualties and losses of the war. But what stood out most to me was that the Israeli people were in protest in one another. There was disunity of the people and that to me, is a sign of weakness for the rest of the world to say, hey, they're caught off guard. They're fighting their own internal battles. They're disorganized. They're just unified. This would be a perfect time to attack, which is just replayed out again. So it's like Israel is two brothers who don't get along. And when they don't get along, they're looked at as weak. But when the world or entities turn against them, then that's when they're, in, that's when they're unified. You know, I, I wrote down that exactly. I said 1973 Black Panthers, half on nearly half of the population, protest against government leadership. Um, then attack on the holy day Yom Kippur, which is in October, was exactly 50 years to the exact day that the attack happened in 2023, exactly 50 years later. So we have the exact History is literally repeating itself. An ununified peoples attacked by the enemy on the holy day, Yom Kippur. Uh, it is the exact, exact same thing happening all over again. Not only that, is I found it interesting that her military advisor said, do not take action. We were trying to figure out why didn't she why didn't she make moves to protect the borders? And it's because military advisors said do not take action, which I believe I've heard from her reports is exactly what happened uh, the days leading up to the October 7th attack here in 2023. Is that military advisors not, are put, putting the blame on them? And figuratively not seeing clearly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Literally history repeating itself and she did not go with her own gut feeling that mm -hmm. is you're being led by the spirit that gut thing is a spiritual thing that's telling mm -hmm. you, don't listen to that don't mm -hmm. listen to that listen to this you know mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. but yes yeah it was the internal fighting and bickering that was causing the enemies to say, hey, look, they're, they're they they're, can't get uh, that quickly. They're already fighting. <laughs> you know, well, they're it's like the nobody word? picked on my brother but me. So when you come against brothers, they'll fight for each other, but then they spend most of their time bickering. It's like, stop yeah. bickering. 
get along and just be strong in the region. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they could see that they were definitely, um, I think the word is preoccupied, but that's not the word I'm going for, distracted. They were completely distracted by their own internal bickerings that they were completely blind or that allowed military advisors um, to blind her into saying, don't take action. This is going to make us look bad if we're the first one to do this. No, you've been on the reactive ever since the beginning of time. It's time for you to be proactive and to take your stance, David, against Goliath. Like, pick up the five stones, stick it in your pouch. <laughs> don't just go after the one after the other four brothers yeah anyways <laughs> so unity so going back to the um and it's also a recipe for disaster of what we're seeing here as well the enemy is trying to create disunity and conflict that we turned a blind eye to the true underworkings of the enemy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's look over here, sucker punch in the gut over here, you know. All the while, we think that there is a right side and a wrong side, but the wrong, the darkness plays both sides. Mm -hmm. Darkness will play all sides because it benefits from playing all sides, you know. So when we see darkness as person against person or religion against religion, <laughs> the enemy's toying with all part, all pieces involved. He'll cause blindness and manipulation over here. He'll cause anger and hate over here. He'll cause a sense of security over here. And he'll play all sides to get people where he wants them. That's why we have to be completely aware of the enemy and their tactics and, you know, that type of thing on a spiritual level, you know, because mm -hmm. there's so many pieces and players that involved. We as Christians have to be spiritually aware of what's going on and listen to the spirit. I mean, we've talked from a, a spiritual standpoint of the enemy um, playing the puppet master with every all the parties involved. Um, but, you know, they work down through the, the minds and hearts of men. And so we've got to realize that, um, you know, cover all of our bases on from a, a government government church um yeah. standpoint too so mm -hmm. nationally and internationally mm -hmm. so going back to the the excerpt that the egyptian president anwar sadat um spoke of um we had outlined several things that we saw that stuck out uh, to us that we called as bs um <laughs> And so one of the couple of the things that we out I, I outlined myself in the excerpt was um <laughs> let's see, 12 times he said, I'm not, I'm not lying. I I really mean it. Um, you know, you think I might be lying, but I'm not. Uh, honestly, I, I'm really telling the truth. And I feel like when somebody says that so many times, whether in a sentence or a paragraph or in five minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes of talking, it's like, you really want me to believe that you're not lying, but who are, are you doing, trying to convince me more than yourself or you more than me with however many times you're saying that? Um, so that was a red flag for me. The second thing, 12 times he said that. And then 11 times he said, uh, we need to do make it come to an agreement of peace based on justice, peace based on justice, 11 different times. And uh, on page 171, he out he literally he answers that question. What is peace uh, based on judgment? And so he said um, any separate peace between Israel, Egypt and Israel or between any Arab conf confrontation state and Israel will not bring permanent peace based on justice in the entire region. Rather, even as, if peace between all the confrontation states in Israel were achieved in the absence of a just solution to the Palestinian problem, never will there be that durable and just peace upon which the entire world insists today. Make that 12, because uh, I didn't count that. 12 times he said that as well. <laughs> um, a just solution to the Palestinian problem. 
that's his that is what he's saying is a just just solution it, it all revolves around the palestinian problem <clears throat> so in that he said the problem is not that of egypt and israel any separate peace between egypt and israel or between any arab confrontation and state of israel will not bring permanent peace based on justice into the entire into into the entire region this is just a band-aid. So he's like, peace and justice, peace and justice, peace and justice, but not permanently and not just between Egypt and Israel or any other Arab country. Arab confrontation state. Yeah. But what I found very interesting, and I'm going to share, I'm going to turn my screen sideways. I'm going to share uh, a different background here. What I find very interesting, we're going to continue reading and figure out what this a uh, statement he made to the Knesset actually brought about. Um, but this is what irked me the most. Turn, scoot over here. Okay. These are all the Arab nations, um, Arab Muslim nations that uh, I, I was looking online, um, the Arab agreement, the, the Arab agreement party, all these people are saying, yep, we're all Muslims and we're all Arabs. So we, you know, all agree. What I found very interesting is that Israel is the one that they said, you need to solve the Palestinian problem. We don't want Palestinian Arabs. None of this. Um, there were several people that went and calculated not only the square footage of Israel in comparison to all of these Arab Muslim countries, but they also calculated the population difference. And as far as the population difference, all of these countries have 100 times more the population of people. Um, but as far as the land mass, the land mass of these Arab countries is 500 times the size of Israel. And so for Egypt to say, you need to solve the Palestinian problem. You need to give up more of your tiny little sliver of land to uh, put Palestinian Arabs here. Uh, yeah. I find that Even utterly sad. The Sinai Peninsula involved. Look at that tiny little bloop in the middle of the Sinai Peninsula. Right there. That little bloop. We want that back. Plus, we want you to go back to the 1967 yeah. uh, line. Plus, give up the Gaza Strip. Well, not only the Gaza Strip, the Golan Heights, um, the Sinai Peninsula, we want you to give all that back to Egypt. And then we want to give a, you to give up even more of your little tiny strip of land, the Gaza Strip, for the Palestinian Arabs. Because none of us want to deal with them. Mm -hmm. And then the Palestinian uh, people here that who get placed here have, have the audacity to blame Israel for all of their problems. Like, talk about biting the hand that feeds you. That is so stupid and infuriating to me. And so I'm going to leave it at that because it is unconscionably ridiculous. And they say, we are refugees. No, you were given this to inhabit, to take care of, to cultivate, to grow and prosper. You call home. But you're still refugees. You're refugees. 50 years oh, later. How does, work, how does that work out? Yeah. Yeah. 50 years later, you still want to call yourself refugees. And your main argument was what? Your main idea of that insight was what? Every time I read what he was saying, uh, which was just totally another thing that I, I thought was stupid. He said, um, I'll go to the ends of the world, even to <laughs> Jerusalem a couple hours away to make this statement. Um, you didn't go to the ends of the world to uh, figure out a, a problem to the Palestinian, you know, and he literally called it a Palestinian problem, his words, not ours. Um, so he put all of that on Israel, but I completely see this as a Trojan horse. Pete, the Trojan horse is peace, peace, we come in peace, but on the inside, we're putting the Palestinian problem in your hands so that for the next 50 years, they could be um, building their tunnels under hospitals and universities and uh, elementary schools and and daycare so that 50 years later to the date of Yom Kippur, we can attack you from the inside yet again. It didn't work when we attacked you from the outside. And when we told you we didn't want peace, 
we gave you three no's. Remember, we're never going to recognize you. <laughs> we're never going to have peace with you. What were those? Um, no negotiations with Israel, no peace with Israel, no recognition of Israel. Well, that didn't work. So now we're going to give you this Trojan horse of peace. We're going to make you take the Palestinian problem. And then 50 years later, we're going to have wait until there's uh, unrest in your nation. Actually, I'm pretty sure they funded that unrest. Uh, we're going to attack you on your holy day on a, on a Sabbath so that nobody's prepared. And we're going to have our your military leaders from the inside. We're going to pay them off. We're going to do whatever to make them advise that nothing happened. Like, don't prepare for war. Don't watch and don't listen to um, these, you know, threats of attack. So, yeah. Mm. That's yeah. that's my viewpoint. Yeah. Uh, one thing I got from the Camp David meeting, brokered by President Jimmy Carter at Camp David, which I love how the U.S. is brokering it. It was because of the U.S. that these things got accomplished. <laughs> Um, Menachem Begin, I don't mm -hmm. know, Prime Minister of Israel, his one of the ends of his. I'll go ahead and read the whole quote, but I'll point out what stood out to me. Quote: My colleagues and I have gone in the footsteps of our predecessors since the very first day we were called by our people to care for their future. We went any place, we looked for any avenue, we made any effort to bring about negotiations between Israel and its neighbors, negotiations without which peace remains an abstract desire. That to me, that means to me, negotiations, negotiations without which peace remains an abstract, abstract meaning it wasn't quantifiable, it wasn't qualifiable, quantifiable qualifiable or quantifiable, nor was it clearly defined, but it still remains an abstract desire. Mm -hmm. So their promise of peace, the negotiations of peace, still remain abstract. They've, mm -hmm. they've, been, they've been two against one and, and backed into a corner and they caved to give up all the land, to give, it, give up part of the region mm -hmm. or an abstract idea. Yeah, well, let's, that segues perfectly into the rest of what was written on page 167 and, and 168. So um, it said, do you want to read? Because I've done a lot of reading. <laughs> so it says, let's briefly outline the peace process. During the Six-Day War of 1967, Egyptian President Nasser lost sovereignty over the Sinai Peninsula. His successor, President Anwar Sadat, was determined to regain it. In an effort to negotiate with Israel, he flew to Jerusalem and met with Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin. The, I, and I apologize if I butchered that. The negotiations looked promising but fizzled out due to outstanding issues. U.S. President Jimmy Carter wrote to Prime Minister Begin to encourage him to continue pursuing peace with Sadat, whom he also believed to truly desire peace. President Car Carter invited both leaders to Camp David, a presidential retreat in Maryland, in September of 1978. I want to write these dates down. 1978, Camp David. Okay, facts are important. <laughs> Finally, after 22 revisions of an initial U.S. draft, two documents were drafted, one dealing with the West Bank slash Gaza and Palestinian rights, and the other dealing with an Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty. Thirteen days later, both parties signed the Camp David Accords. Prime Minister Begin and President Sadat won the Nobel Peace Prize as a result. Six months after, both sides signed the Egypt-Israel Peace Treaty of 1979. Egypt regained the Sinai Peninsula, while Israel normalized diplomatic relations with an Arab country, a significant and a historic breakthrough. So what did Sadat give Carter during the first part of the negotiations? What was the United States role during the negotiations and why? <laughs> That's an important question. What were on the ground, beyond the ground results of the Camp David Accords and who won the Nobel Peace Prize as a result of the Camp David Accords? Do we want to think that over or do we want to continue? <laughs> well, the first question, what did Sadat give Carter during the first part of the negotiation? 
gave him a list of extensive and extreme demands, which he expected Beguine to outright reject. Yeah. Sounds like what you do to Brian. <laughs> I'm going to give her a thousand dollars. Just kidding. A hundred. <laughs> Make it sound good. Right. <laughs> Three days into the negotiations, both Sadat and Begin allowed Carter to control the flow of information and did not meet together again until the last days. So they could only see in each other's presence for three days, and they allowed Jimmy Carter con to control the flow of information. Mm -hmm. Apparently 22 back and forths, because there were 22 revisions of the initial draft. It's not just an initial draft. It was an initial U.S. draft. Mm -hmm. Two documents were drafted, one dealing with the West Bank and Gaza and Palestinian rights, and the other dealing with the Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty. Why do the Egyptians want to deal with Gaza, the West Bank, and the Palestinians on a separate sheet of paper? That's what I see. Mm -hmm. They are not us. Deal with this separately from us. They are separate from us. You deal with them, as you said. That is, I am washing my hands of them. They are not involved in this. Not even on the same piece of paper. That's mm -hmm. what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. And then the next question, which is, what was the United States' role during the negotiations? We kind of cover that. They were the go-between because they are the telephone the line. They are the telephone. Huh. They're just the telephone, telephone line. line. He said this. He said this. He said this. Mm-hmm. And what were the on-the-ground results of the Camp David Accords? I find that's funny. They signed all this. They did all of this in, what did I write down? 1978. They began in 1978, September. September. And then it wasn't signed um, until 1979. Less than a year Previous November twentieth, nineteen seventy seven, and when Nas when uh, Sadat went to the Knesset to deliver his speech, all about peace, he can be in a room full of Israelis speaking his own words without problem, but you put him in a conversation or a back and forth, he can't handle it. And in his speech, he said he would go to the ends of the world. Yeah. But it's going to take 22 revisions of a peace agreement uh, to, to normalize diplomatic relations. Yeah. And I want to re-outline these dates. In 1967, the Sinai, the Sinai Peninsula was lost by the previous president of Egypt, Nasser. Sadat took office in October of 1970. The uh, he was assassinated 11 years later, but in 1973, he that's when he was told the Americans he wanted peace but engaged in war with Israel. Four years later, he wanted he said this meeting, and then less than a year later, he met at Camp, Camp David. So, I'm seeing a lot of this don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. Is what's going on. Two face. Yeah. 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 And it, uh, continuing on reading, it said, well, they both won the Nobel Prize by. So it was. I the think last. that was, I think that wasn't because of, I think that was a part of the agreement. If you two can agree, we'll make sure that you're remembered in the world as two men who wanted peace. Here's your gold ribbons. I think that was part of the agreement. I think that was kind of like, hey, you two will go down in history no matter what crap you've done <laughs> or didn't do as Nobel Peace Prize winners. <laughs> I, th I think that's what it is. Could be. Just, you know, I'm already in a tizzy. So let's just... <laughs> It says the Camp David Accords were a watershed moment in Israeli history in which an Arab country acknowledged Israel and came to the table to agree on a solid framework for peace. Unfortunately, as a result of the peace process, Egypt was ostracized by other Arab countries for nearly a decade, branded traitors to the Arab cause. Sadat was assassinated in 1981, three years after winning the Nobel Peace Prize. Sadat's successor, Hosni Mubarak, 
vowed to maintain the peace agreement. The agreement between Israel and Egypt has now been maintained for over 40 years. Did you know, 15 years after the peace treaty with Egypt, Israel achieved another peace treaty with an Arab country. In 1994, Jordan and Israel signed a historic agreement normalizing relations between the two states. You can learn more by watching Kufai's micro-history video, Peace with Jordan, available on Kufai's website and also on YouTube. So we'll post that link. I might play it at the end of this um, so you can watch that. So... So when all sun is said and done, we can sit here and complain in the comfort of our own homes, not in charge of anything but our own household. <laughs> in hindsight, 2020. Mm -hmm. But the good part is, out of all that, the good part is those two things. We're, they're still technically at peace, and they still technically are at peace with another Arab country until things May or may not fall out the bottom. <laughs> yeah. Until uh, Ezekiel 38, Ezekiel 39 raises its head in its entirety for the entire world to see. Because yeah. right now, they are operating under uh, cover of darkness. And when those five nations that are listed uh, decide to make themselves known, which I believe some of them already have, uh, obviously made themselves known. Um, yeah. That's when we're going to see the hand of God move uh, for its, its pe his people and his land. Yeah. Hallelujah. All right. Moving on. Lesson 15, which is on page 176. Very short, just two pages worth of reading. And uh, let's see. We've got one or two micro history videos to watch. Uh, actually, just one. The rest is a bunch of websites um, that uh, you can check out. So we'll give those at the end here. I'll start us off here. It says, uh, at the end of this lesson, you should be able to explain the implications of the PLO's rise in Lebanon, discuss Israel's invasions of Lebanon in 1978 and 1982, and summarize Hezbollah's rise in the region. Um. Let's see, it says, as you read about some of the threats Israel has faced and still faces, pray for a deeper commitment to Paul's exhortation in Romans uh, 12, verse 9, which says, let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Here in the South, we like to say, eat the hay and spit out the sticks. <laughs> so cling to what is good, abhor what is evil. Um, and so clean, other things and cling is not just lo loosely hold on to it is you you are having to grab onto it something is going to come by at some point and try and rip it from your grasp you may be rocked by the greatest storm but you have to hang on hold fast mm -hmm. you know so don't yeah. be caught in your wares <laughs> and, and and not to be swayed by uh, you know, because they, they always say, if you can't beat them, join them. Well, that's a bunch of crap. <laughs> Stick to your guns. Stick yeah. to your guns. A hundred percent. smarter. <laughs> What'd you say? Uh, don't, you know, instead of like they say work hard, it's like work smarter, not harder. <laughs> you know, if you can't beat them, just outright brute strength, get smarter. Don't give up. Don't go to the other side. Keep going. Yeah. So... Um, it says, in our last lesson, we learned about the 1973 Yom Kippur War and the risks and challenges it brought to the state of Israel. We also learned about Egyptian President Sadat's unprecedented visit to Jerusalem and the resulting landmark peace agreement between Israel and Egypt, the first such agreement between an Arab country and the modern Jewish state. Now we're going to look at another defining conflict for the state of Israel, the Lebanon War. This war, complicated by Palestinian terrorists and the shifting sands of Middle East politics, would prove to be a watershed moment for the Israeli populace in many ways. In order to have a basic overview of the conflict, watch this short video, Kufai's Microhistory, uh, 1982, First Lebanon War. So we're going to go ahead and take a quick peek at that, and then we'll continue reading.
During the 1970s and 80s, the violent terrorist group known as the Palestinian Liberation Organization, led by Yasser Arafat, used their position within the villages of southern Lebanon to launch multiple deadly attacks on Israel's northern towns. After several years, Israel could no longer tolerate these endless attacks on its civilian population. Yasser Arafat's terrorist army was growing larger and more dangerous inside Lebanon as the death toll from the PLO's terrorism steadily rose. The situation reached a crisis when a Palestinian terrorist cell tried to assassinate Israel's ambassador to Great Britain. On June 6, 1982, Israel sent the IDF into southern Lebanon to drive the PLO out of its hiding place and destroy the threat against Israeli citizens in Operation Peace for Galilee. American officials supported Israel's war against the PLO in Lebanon. President Ronald Reagan publicly supported Israel's right to defend its citizens from the intolerable threat of ongoing terrorism that violated Israel's sovereignty. The war was difficult. The Palestinian terrorists were deeply entrenched in southern Lebanon's villages. And just like today, the terrorists hid behind civilian human shields. For three years, Israel was forced to keep the IDF in Lebanon to prevent the PLO from regaining control of the area along Israel's northern border. Ultimately, Israel lost 1,216 soldiers in Lebanon before withdrawing in 1985 and leaving behind a small buffer force to maintain order along the border. Israel did not fully withdraw from southern Lebanon until May 24, 2000. Israel's defeat of the PLO left a power vacuum in Lebanon that was soon filled by the rise of Iran's terrorist army, Hezbollah. Hezbollah has steadily gained power and is now entrenched as an official part of Lebanon's government. With Iran's help, Hezbollah has stockpiled over 150,000 rockets in southern Lebanon in preparation for a future attack on Israel that would potentially send over 1,000 rockets per day into Israel. Okay, so we just saw Kufai's micro history of 1982, the first Lebanon war and um what stuck out to you uh on, on that video once again we have a terrorist group attacking civilian population mm -hmm. um, two actually <laughs> the plo which Israel went and fought with. And then when they removed themselves from Le Southern Lebanon in 2000, it created a power vacuum. And who filled that terrorist's position? Another terrorist organization, Hezbollah. So uh, the other thing that stood out was Israel was sent into Southern Lebanon to protect or destroy the threat of uh, against Israeli citizens and the Operation Peace for Galilee. So this is not outside the purview of a sovereign nation to defend its territory and its people from all threats, foreign and domestic. American officials, uh, that was the other thing, too. Um, I like the quote of Ronald uh, Reagan when he it says he publicly supported Israel's right, or it's not a quote, but he su publicly supported Israel's right to defend its citizens from the intolerable threat of ongoing terrorism that violated Israel's sovereignty. That is, it's intolerable, it's been ongoing, and it's a violation of Israel's sovereignty, it's a violation of the Geneva Vic Code of Conventions for any type of wartime activity. You know what I mean? Um, once again, it said that the terrorists hid behind civilian human shields which they are still doing today. And as you said, Hezbollah has been the, uh, it's reestablished there, which is just prophetic of what's going on today where over a thousand rockets are being shot per day into Israel by everyone that's been bothering them. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. This is not new. 
Nothing is new. Nothing should catch anybody off guard. Not from either side. The only thing that's new are the the formidable Thanks. minds of the youth of our nation who don't read a lick of history at all. They pay attention to YouTube and Instagram and TikTok, all the lies that are fed to them through propaganda and disinformation. And then they go try to stand on their soapboxes and claim murderers as uh, the the poor, oh, you know, citizens that, uh, you know, it's all Israel's fault. Are, are you freaking stupid? <laughs> That's well, exactly yeah. what I want to say. Well, yes, because foreign money has been given to fund our higher education, which they inst they instill uh, the these ideologic lies to the youth of America. They put in their they they give to colleges who hire professors who spout lies and lies and disinformation, as you said, on young formidable minds who haven't been taught how to think logically, haven't been taught how to go find any credible sources of truth or think for themselves. Like you said, they are Pete, they are the repeats of the Pete's. Pete and repeat. And then when they're faced in the real world of what do you mean? Where do you think you're even talking about? Who do you think did they, they can't, they get, they curse, they throw things, they, and then they walk off. Mm -hmm. You know, well, not only uh, foreign funded in our educational system, but foreign funded in our social uh, media as well. I mean, on every side, seven mountains of influence that are in, in any nation, um, our nation and our children have come under attack in every single area. Um, we we know all about them. Thank you, Lance Wall, now <laughs> for outlining these and keeping us um, up to date on them for the last 20 plus years. Um, but our family has been under attack. Our educational system has been under attack. Our businesses have been under attack. Our religion has been under attack. Um, our government has been under attack in our military. Um, media, arts, and entertainment is completely and just unquantifiably been under attack by the enemy. Um, and then our science and technology and what's happened in light of 2020 and everything else that we know and don't know that's happened before and after 2020 with all um our food systems our air our water even insects um being manipulated uh with with sickness and diseases and viruses and things like that it's it's not new it's been happening for 100 years if not more than 100 years um in this nation and i dare say since the beginning of its founding um enemies and traitors and spies uh placed here to infiltrate every every area of this nation um, for a final outcome. Yeah, and, it's come down, make them lazy, and have a multi-pronged attack. Mm -hmm. It won't work. It's still it's not. <laughs> not, going, not going to work. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. So, uh, next little reading bit here, and then uh, I'll read, I guess, uh, to the first paragraph, and then Katie, if you want to take over there. Okay. Um, page 176, 19... 82 to 1985. During the 1970s and 80s, the violent terrorist, terrorist group known as the Palestinian Liberation Organization, aka the PLO, led by Yasser Arafat, used their position within the villages of southern Lebanon to launch multiple deadly attacks on Israel's northern towns. That, After some that, that is worth pointing out. That I'm glad we decided to read it again because it wasn't a military base. It was they instilled themselves in the, their own civilian villages in places mm -hmm. to attack. So whenever you're attacking from a civilian point, you're willing to accept your own civilians' casualties. You know? Mm -hmm. You're putting in other people in the, like they said, human shields, and that just tells you exactly why. Isn't it, wasn't it something like about the PLO should be not been taken off the list of a terrorist organization they wanted to do? Was it the PLO that they wanted off? I don't, I don't know. But the thing is, despite the fact that uh, Leather Lebanon and the PLO started attacking is Israel's northern towns, 
Um, it says after several years, Israel could not tolerate these endless attacks on its civilian population. But regardless, the thing that I want to point out, no, no matter how many times these terrorist organizations use and kill and murder uh, men, women, and children and use them as human shields, Israel does everything in its capacity to only attack military and pseudo-military and the terrorist organizations themselves. That is why they are meticulously and continue to meticulously go building to building, house to house, uh, university to university, hospital to hospital, digging out and routing through who they think could be a terrorist and who is not, so that they do not have civilian casualties. The last thing Israel has ever wanted was to attack and to kill innocent lives. It's always the enemy, all these terrorist organizations that don't care who dies as long as they achieve their wicked end game. And so that's what I love about Israel is that they do everything that they possibly can to limit civilian casualties, even if it means killing or at least, you know, going in, uh, like I said, door to door and putting their military personnel on the line um, going door to door in this kind of urban warfare, uh, very much guerrilla warfare, um, you know, methodology. They're being very meticulous. Uh, and that's what I love about Israel is that they don't stoop to the level of the wicked that are attacking them. And, and that's what I love about Israel. Yeah. And the one thing I wanted to point out, Yasser Arafat, was he was not actually from Lebanon, right? I thought I heard that he was not originally from there, but he claimed to be a uh, Palestinian, or that's what it was, because he's a leader of the Palestinian liberal organization. He's not, actually not Palestinian at all, but he You're, claimed to be. He was born in Cairo, Egypt. Yeah. And he died in Paris, France. Yeah. So, I mean, they don't really care who leads them, but the fact that he, <laughs> okay, timeline. Egypt lies to the United States, presuming to want to talk about peace. And the other hand, they're attacking Israel and the um, six day war begins. They lose. Um, <laughs> then we have the Yom Kippur war. Uh, they lose again. Now they want to present peace. So Sadat comes, has this little fluffy, um, you know, Knesset presentation, and then behind closed doors uh, continues to be super, super difficult in um, negotiations with Israel. He gets offed. And then here comes Yasser Arafat, also from Egypt, to take his place. Um, but instead of taking his place in Egypt, he begins to say, okay, I'm going to be a part of this Palestinian liberator liberation organization uh, and convinces the Palestinians that he's he's uh, the right man to lead them, even though he's from Egypt, <laughs> has seemingly no ties to, to Palestine or the Palestinian people at all. I find that very interesting. <sighs> okay, okay. I, I want to correct my question. The Biden administration, February 16, 2021, lifted the designation of the Houthis in Yemen as a terrorist group, global terrorist group. But just three short years later, January of this year, they put them back off. It was the Houthis, not the PLO. Okay. But he took them off and then he put them back off. Okay. So. Uh, again, after several years, Israel could no longer tolerate these endless attacks on its civilian population. Yasser Arafat's terrorist army was growing larger and more dangerous inside Lebanon as the death toll from the PLO's terrorism death steadily rose. The situation re reached a crisis when a Palestinian terrorist cell tried to assassinate Israel's ambassador to Great Britain. On June 6, 1982, Israel sent the IDF into southern Lebanon to drive the PLO out of its hiding place and destroy the threat against Israeli citizens in Operation Peace for Galilee. And I'll let you take over. American officials supported Israel's war against the PLO in Lebanon, 
President Ronald Reagan publicly supported Israel's right to defend its citizens from the intolerable threat of ongoing terrorism that violated Israel's sovereignty. The war was difficult. The Palestinian terrorists were deeply entrenched in southern Lebanon's villages, just like today, the terrorists hid behind civilian human shields. For three years, Israel was forced to keep the IDF in Lebanon to prevent the PLO from regaining control of the area along Israel's northern border. Ultimately, Israel lost 1,216 soldiers in Lebanon before withdrawing in 1985 and while leaving behind a small buffer force to maintain order along the border. Israel did not fully withdraw from southern Lebanon until May 24, 2000. So on the think it over questions, um, we have six here. What was the Palestinian Liberation Organization doing in Israel in the 1970s and early 1980s? Whom did the PLO try to assassinate? What was Israel's response? What is the official Israeli name of the first Lebanon war? Why was the war so challenging? And what did Israel's defeat of the PLO in Lebanon accomplish? We want to answer them. I mean, they're self-explanatory. We heard it in the video. We read it again. Um, in the 1970s and 80s, they tried. They did not just try. They successively killed civilians, uh, men, women, and children, and used them as human sh shields cowards. Um, whom did the PLO try to assassinate? Israel's ambassador to Great Britain. What is Israel's response? They went into southern Lebanon to drive the PLO out. Um, what was the official Israeli name of the first Lebanon war? Um, well, Operation Peace for Galilee was the uh, actual um, name of the operation itself. And why was the war so challenging? Well, trying to drive out a, a, a force not in your country, number one, but is attacking your country from the northern border and hiding behind civilians. Um, did I say cowards? Let me say it again. Um, and then what did Israel's defeat of the PLO in Le Lebanon accomplish? Well, uh, it created a power vacuum, which uh, allowed Hezbollah, another terrorist organization, to move in. Um, so continuing on, there's a lot of articles that we can read. Um, there's an article called My Forgotten War in Lebanon, published by Tablet Magazine. You'll find that in the uh, links uh, for additional resources. So those are uh, articles that you can uh, look at. Um, and that article is a personalized account of the author's time as a soldier in the IDF during the first Lebanon war. The IDF is one of the key institutions of Israeli society. While some exemptions are issued, most individuals will serve their country as either servicemen and women or through a parallel community service program. The mandatory draft contributes not only to the strength and security of Israel, but also to a heightened sense of civic responsibility for the country and its citizens. The IDF's commitment to enabling as many individuals as possible to serve in its ranks is highlighted by the unit nine, uh, nine I wouldn't know how you say it, unit 9900, okay, which was created to allow teens with autism to serve. So obviously it says that they could be serve their country as servicemen and women or through a parallel community service program. So of course they do not mean that they put teens with autism <laughs> in the military, but allows them to assist with community service programs um, to help support Israel uh, as a whole. That's what I'm gathering from that. All right, part two. The asymmetrical nature of the 1982 Lebanon war was challenging for the Israeli forces. Initially, the war's goal was to destroy the PLO bases in southern Lebanon that had been responsible for the rocket and artillery barrages into Israel. The Israeli military quickly dispatched the PLO bases. Once Israel had control of a significant portion of Lebanon, the Israeli Minister of Defense, Ariel Sharon, and the Army Chief of Staff, Rafael Etan, 
permitted the Lebanese phalangists, a Christian militia, and Israel's allies to enter two Palestinian refugees camps as part of the transfer of power back to the Lebanese. The phalangists were themselves at war with the Palestinian terrorist groups that had infiltrated the country. The fighting with Arafat and the Palestinians destabilized the Christian Lebanese government and its infrastructure. Further complicating the situation was Syria, which had invaded Lebanon in the late 1970s and which partnered with the Palestinians to contribute to the instability of the Lebanese Christian government. In early September 1982, Lebanese President-elect Bashir Gemayel was assassinated by these allied forces. The following week, the phalangists asked permission from the Israeli military to enter the Sabra and Shatila refugee camps to search for Palestinian militants. The phalangists massacred the Palestinian civilians in the camps with estimates of 460 to 800 people killed. While the Arab world was upset, was quiet about the deaths, deaths, okay, this is important, Palestinian civilian camps, the Arab world was quiet about their deaths. The Israeli public was outraged on their behalf. 400,000 Israelis demonstrated in Tel Aviv against the war and the massacre. The Israeli government opened an inquiry into the events around the deaths at Sabra and Shatila. According to the report, Defense Minister Sharon was found indirectly responsible for the massacre. The report chastised Sharon, saying that given the relationship between the phalangists and the Palestinians, Sharon should have realized that there was potential for brutality. Sharon resigned, oh, sorry, resigned, and Eitan was dismissed. So there's an activity too on reflection to choose some of the following prompts, then reflect on it and write a short journal entry as responses to the prompts which we can do you can do on your own time <laughs> go ahead and just read the prompts so they can have an understanding of what it is if they don't have a book in front of them so the first one is henry kissinger the u.s secretary of state said that the israeli investigation into the sabra and shatila massacre was quote a great tribute to israeli democracy dot 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 there are very few governments in the world that one can imagine making such a public investigation of such a difficult and shameful episode, end quote. What do you think of the Kissinger statement? And do you agree or disagree with it and why? <laughs> the Phalangists actually committed the massacre against the Palestinian civilians, yet Israeli society decided that its own military had some culpability. What does this say about the Israeli people? And in your opinion, was Israel right to hold its military leaders accountable? Why or why not? And what do you think, quote, uh, in the quote, 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 end quote, indirect responsibility means? Do you think that there should be a factor in making military decisions? Why or why not? And lastly, as a Christian, what are your thoughts on the phalangist massacre at Sabra and Shatila? What do your Christian values inform your understanding of complicated political and military situations? So, very interesting and good questions. Mm -hmm. Lots to discuss and negotiate there. Yeah. But once again, we do see a replaying of Syria with Lebanon. The, Lebanon, the Lebanese government at that time was Christian. The president was assassinated by the allied forces of Palestinian and Syrian groups, or Syria. And um, the Phalangists, which is an interesting name, They were themselves at war with the Palestinian terror groups that had infiltrated the country. So whether they knew more than the Israeli government about who was in those camps and what those camps were actually for, 
Um, we know not. But I don't believe that all military leaders should be held responsible uh, for leaving an area once the agreement for the area has been found by all parties. It's no longer in your hands or your responsibility. It's not like they left the place without someone to hold things responsible. They didn't leave it to empty hands. They didn't leave it to seemingly irresponsible hands. But that gives you the heart and mind of Israel for people who are not directly involved in direct threats and conflict. They had a heart for the Palestinian refugees, even there. They don't like militants. They don't like terrorists that attack civilians. But when it's the other way around, you know that their heart and minds are pure about it. So anyways, next it says, the Lebanon war was a complicated conflict for Israel. In seeking to defend its civilians against terror and rockets, the Israeli military was confronted with its first asymmetrical war and found itself managing its operations in city streets, armed against militants and terrorists. Becoming embroiled in the local Lebanese conflict between the government, the Palestinians and the Syrians, the Israeli military also became involved in the Sabra and Shatila massacre. massacre. Israeli society's outrage highlighted the populace's strong moral center and their focus on holding their army to a high standard. Due to Israel's victory, the PLO was weakened and eradicated from Lebanon, paving the way for the Oslo Accord several years later. Next, there's optional uh, further for further study and reflection. Uh, there's two options here um, to see a docu documentary and discuss with the study buddy or family or your small groups and friends. JerusalemU.org, they can search Beneath the Helmet. But the actual link is beneaththehelmet.jerusalemu.org forward slash watch dash at dash home. <laughs> the other option is to read QFI's briefing, Hezbollah, Party of Allah, to understand how the Iran-trained Hezbollah fighters leveraging Lebanese angers at Israel's presence in the country to create an army intent on destroying Israel. And then you can discuss with your buddy, your family, or friends, and the link can be found below under additional resources. So, um, anyways, that is the end of Lesson 15. Uh, I'll post some links after this video so that you can see them if you want to take a quick uh, screenshot of them and go and read and discuss further with your groups. Our next video, which will be video 11, uh, we're going to cover lesson 16, uh, which is the peace process and in, intifadas. And if we have time, not sure if we will or not, we'll dive into lesson, lesson 17 as well, which talks about recent challenges. Um, so thank you all for watching, for listening, um, you know, share it with friends and family, people you want to know this information, people who uh, want to see uh, American citizens and Christians support Israel um, and uh, do what you can to get involved uh, with kufi.org if you're looking to, to join Christians United for Israel. Um, they Don't let our opinions factor into your opinions. Go to the facts. I told my, I tell my children too. Don't go to dot coms. Don't go to Wikipedia. Go to the dot govs dot edu dot orgs. Find newspaper articles, things like that to substantiate and corroborate truth. Okay, and it's not my truth or whatever. It is the truth and only the truth. So. Go search, find your answers for yourself. Don't base what we say as the where all be all to your own opinions and things. You can agree if you want, but only after you you do the work, you do the thinking, that kind of, kind of thing too. So 
Yeah. And I say and, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, um, don't don't just look at it as a one sided argument. Um, see, I, of course, we're going to have two different sides of opinion, um, two different, um, you know, from an Israeli standpoint, from a, your uh, American standpoint, um, and then from, you know, their adversaries. So whether it's Hezbollah or uh, the PLO, um, whatever it is, but do your research. Don't just listen to one person's point of view. Listen to people um, who've been there, who's done that uh, from a civilian standpoint, from a military standpoint, from a government standpoint um, as well. And debate is done with adding more and more factual information. Our, our own opinions can change based on the gathering of more facts, truths, you know, so we are not rigid in our stances either. We may change like, oh, well, we'll rescind that comment or we'll change our viewpoint a little bit on that. And that is okay to say, okay, knowing what we had known, this is how we felt. But now that we know more, we change. <laughs> or we can flat out say, oh, we had no clue. We were completely wrong. We apologize that our stances are not rigid and we are not too stubborn to admit when we are wrong as well. <laughs> so that's also an option. Anyways, thank you for watching. Have a great rest of your day or night, wherever you are, and we will see you for our next video. Bye-bye. So I'm going to read um, activity one. Uh, it is the tablet mag article written by Daniel Seaman. Um, subtitle here for the article says 36 years ago this week, my friends and I headed north to fight the PLO. Rarely discussed today. The battles we fought changed us all. Uh, this was written on June 7th of 2018. Um, it says the bravado ends with the first sound of gunfire. The moment you realize this is for real, that someone is actually trying to kill you. Then it is all business and the years of training kick in and you instinctively react to identify and neutralize the threat, though not before your body reacts with its own instinct, fear. The sinking feeling in the stomach that paralyzes every inch, every hair on your, uh, every hair on your entire body. Your knees literally buckle and shake. You want to puke and your survival instinct says run, but you are a trained paratrooper. You switch to combat mode almost simultaneously. Like every year in June, I am drawn back to that day 36 years ago. I open the dusty album of fading photos of my army buddies and me and the memories flood my mind. That day we embarked on an operation that was to end up being a war that was to last for 18 years dubbed Operation Peace for Galilee, it would become the Lebanon War and then subsequently the first Lebanon War, the Forgotten War. Not forgotten for us though, it defined our generation. We were after all members of the elite Israeli paratrooper brigade, the storied 890th Airborne Battalion with a reputation to uphold and uphold it we did. Militarily, the campaign was a huge success we had trained for this for nearly two years to remove the threat of PLO terrorists from Israel's northern border. We fought the Syrian commandos and beat them in a maneuver taught to this day in infantry schools in the United States. In 10 days, we made it to Beirut. Within three months, took the capital of an Arab country and had the PLO expelled altogether. The war was controversial, though for political reasons, but we weren't politicians. We were just soldiers who had a duty to perform. More than that, we were just average young guys who were doing the their compulsory military service. By the time the war came about, we had spent three intense years together. Basic training, parachute school, exercises in border patrols, non-commissioned officers course, and finally the prestigious support company where we took part in combat operations against PLO terrorist positions and strongholds in South Lebanon. We had a cache of experiences between us and that bonded us together in that unique brotherhood. 
We met as teenagers out of high school and matured into young men together. We could not have been more different than we were that first day we met. Udi and Sliz from Givara In, Seeger from Patak Tikva, Lerner from Ramat Gan, Kobe from Tel Aviv, Kikas from Kibbutz Kinneret, John, a lone soldier immigrant from England who settled in the Golan and hardly spoke a word of Hebrew. Ronan, the Moshavnik, Moshavnik, the gentle farmer giant. And one, Michael Oren, an American lone soldier older than us. It was the best of times and it was the worst of times indeed. Mostly the best. We knew each other better than anyone else. We knew each other at our finest and our weakest moments at our best and worst, our strengths and faults. We literally had each other's backs. We had each other. There was no stronger bond between men than that forged in a combat unit. Those were the years that made us into the men we are today. When I look back at that day so long ago, one more thing besides the fear we all felt sticks out in my memory. Though we clearly understood what the battle was about and what we needed to go to war over, we were not fighting for our people or for our country. We weren't even fighting for the defense of our families as much as that is indeed a noble reason. No, we were fighting for each other. That is what got us over the paralyzing fear, got us to move and go into action, got us to charge in the, ba in the battlefield at the logic-defying manner, not to let each other down. We trusted each other and our lives depended on one another. War is nothing like the sterile version you see in movies. All human senses are on edge at their extreme. I can still sense it all. We were dirty and sweaty from the summer heat, the burden of equipment we carried, the gunpowder that covered us and stuck in the nostrils. We were tired and exhausted from extending ourselves. The emotional burden is heavy. You sleep any moment you can. We had our usual dark humor to keep us going and pranks and jokes we would pull on each other even in the midst of battle. There were the light moments when, while fighting Syrian commandos in a village, Lerner found the time to sneak a quick shower in a house we took cover in. Then there was the silence when, while waiting outside another village as our reconnaissance unit fought, we watched as the wounded were evacuated. Each one of us caught up in our personal thoughts of that which we would not speak of out loud. At night, while on guard duty, we would have long heart-to-heart -heart conversations. Udi and I spoke about how we were mostly worried about our families, how our families would react if, God forbid, they would receive the worst news. We hardly spoke of our mortality, but it hovered over all of us. Zellinger bemoaned the fact that we were all single. All the prestige of the Red Berets and parachuting wings weren't enough to hold on to relationships for the three weeks before we got home again. He said that the only thing he was sorry about was that, quote, the only ones crying over my grave would be all of you a-holes, <laughs> end quote. Itan was one of the guys who joined us in the support unit a few months after us. At Kibbutznik, he was a member of Israel Israel's national water polo team, tall and blonde with the swimmer's body physique of a Grecian statue. He was supposed to attend the water polo World Cup, but stayed on with us. He couldn't leave his buddies. He was the commander of the APC-1 I was driving, and as we rode into combat in the city of Demur, he and I were on the calm together. In my entire life, I never said Shema Israel as many times as I did during that two-hour battle. As our unit missed the planned route and ran smack into the city, taking gunfire and anti-tank missiles from all directions, Itan kept giving me instructions, letting me know we were all fine and not hit. Anytime I eased up on the Shema Israel, Itan yelled, Seaman, Afo Shema Israel, where are, you, where are the Hear O Israel prayers? Indeed, there were no atheists in the foxhole. Holes. 36 years later, and unlike the photos, the memories haven't faded. We, oh, that's going to make me cry. We see each other every so often and keep up with each other's lives. We have grown older, have moved on in different directions got an education, have careers, started our own families, and brought up our kids with the values we learned so long ago. All of us except, that is, except Itan. Itan Rodham was killed in action on Thursday, August 19, 1982, ambushed while on patrol near Beirut. He was 21 years old. He was just a kid. We all were.
That is that. JP? Yep. So the paired discussion just says to read it out loud and discuss what is striking or challenging to you about this essay. Is there a particular aspect that resonates with you? And the second question, most Israeli teens go into the army at 18. Understanding the broad strokes of the Lebanon war, how do you think you would feel if you were a soldier in that kind of situation? You answer. <laughs> Well, I found it interesting. I didn't realize as we were going through kind of this study on this chapter um, that he mentions that the um, operation that they called it Peace for Galilee lasted so long. Um, it says it was to last 18 years. So it's just, we didn't do the math. Um, well, they left in 2000. June 6, 1982 is when it began, and they um, did not fully withdraw from southern Lebanon until May 24, 2000. So that spanned a full 18 years. Of a lot of our going into battle, uh, or going into war, going into military service for 18 years, and they decided to stay on for the full 18 years. They live just as much as their life in that heavy, intense battle. Um, like you said, it's like all of your senses are completely heightened and in this state of uh, fight or flight, you know, every single day for 18 years, <laughs> the same amount of years that they had lived oh, is the, yeah. the same amount of years that they've spent in this heightened emotional state of constantly trying to fight and survive, not just for themselves, but for their their brothers in arms, and and then of course for their families and their nation and things like that. But they said that the main thing is just fighting and protecting the brothers beside you. Um, so I'm like, mm -hmm. uh, it's hard, hard to read it. An American lone soldier that he mentioned. <laughs> yeah. So there was one um, that was from Britain, I think he said, as a lone soldier, and then there was an American lone soldier uh, as well. Um, did you hear about what that lone, what it means to be a lone soldier? John, an immigrant from England, and then Michael Oren, an American lone soldier. So they're basically, I whether they're Jews or not, they basically leave their country to choose to go fight for Israel. They don't have family, they don't have connections, they just sign up and they go. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, a lone soldier is a soldier in the IDF with no family in Israel to support him or her. Um, it's either a new immigrant, a volunteer from abroad, an orphan, or an individual individual from a broken home. The challenges for these soldiers arise when he or she leaves base. There's no one to go home to. No one. They are left to fend for themselves while on leave from the army. This can be once a month or every single weekend, depending on where they serve and what kind of training they're in. There are more currently, as this article is being written, over 7,000 lone soldiers with no immediate family in Israel to support them. Though they're highly motivated and proud to serve when on leave, many of them struggle with the basic needs that a family would solve. So that's commendable as well. <laughs> Very. And for anyone who's watching this video, we were discussing about uh, two weeks ago, um, what you could consider lone soldiers in America too. Um, kids who go off to boot camp, whether, uh, you know, young men or young women who don't have family to support their choice to enter the military, uh, whether like what we just read, whether they're um, orphans, whether um, their family just doesn't support them, period. Um, wanting to start an organization that connects volunteers who support our military men and women and youth, literally they're just babies mm -hmm. um, entering military service and being able to support them, whether as pen pals, as showing up to their boot camp graduations and cheering them on, taking them out to dinner, and then just 
uh, building a relationship um, with them and, and showing them the support that they need. So I'd absolutely love to get that started um, in the United States and in Israel too. I mean, <laughs> uh, being able to, to show support. So if you have any connections to uh, the military in any way, whether in Israel or the United States and um, can assist in making those connections, um, connecting volunteers, um, with lone soldier center.com where you can donate in memory of Michael Levine, um, is where I read that information about their definition of a lone soldier in Israel. Lone soldier center.com center. And you can donate there or get involved. Hmm. So maybe we can lean on them uh, to ask how they and what they do and maybe start that, replicate it here in the United States. Yeah. That'd be awesome. Very good. Um, some other uh, readings you can do is uh, virtual jewishvirtuallibrary.org uh, and find the first Lebanon War, uh, Massacres at Sabra and Shati. Next we're going to read from the jewishvirtuallibrary.org. If you want to do a, a search, it's the massacres at Sabra and Shatila, um, which are, were September 16th and 17th of 1982. Um, it says, the Lebanese Christian Phalangist Militia was responsible for the massacres that occur occurred at the two Beirut area refugee camps on September 16th and 17th of 1982. Israeli troops allowed the phalanges to enter Sabra and Satilla to root out terrorist cells believed located there. It had been estimated that there may have been up to 200 armed men in the camps working out of the countless bunkers built by the PLO over the years and stocked with generous reserves of ammunition. When Israeli soldiers ordered the phalanges out, they found hundreds dead. Estimates range from 460, according to the Lebanese police, to 700 to 800, calculated by Israeli intelligence. The dead, according to the Lebanese account, included 35 women and children. The rest were Palestinians, Lebanese, Pakistanis, Iranians, Syrians, and Algerians. The killings came on top of an estimated 95,000 deaths that had occurred during the civil war in Lebanon from 1975 to 1982. The killings were perpetrated to avenge the murders of Lebanese President Bashir Gamayel and 25 of his followers killed in a bomb attack earlier that week. Israel had allowed the Falange to enter the camps as part of a plan to transfer authority to the Lebanese and accepted responsibility for that decision. The Kahan Commission of Inquiry, formed by the Israeli government in response to public outrage and grief, found that Israel was indirectly responsible for not anticipating the possibility of phalangist violence. Okay, they're not mind readers. Um, Israel instituted the panel's recommendations, including the dismal, oh, sorry, the dismissal of General Raful Itan, the Army Chief of Staff. Defense Minister Ariel Sharon resigned on February 8th, 1983. The Kahan Commission declared former Secretary of State Harry, Henry Kissinger, Kissinger was, quote, a great tribute to Israeli democracy. There are very few governments in the world that one can imagine making such a public investigation of such a difficult and shameful episode. Um... That's what, that was Kissinger's uh, quote that we had uh, read earlier. So it's ironically, while 300,000 Israelis demonstrated on September 25th, 1982, um, from our book of study, it says 400,000 uh, Israelis demonstrated um, to protest the killings, little or no reaction occurred in the Arab world. Not really a surprise. Outside the Middle East, I mean, that's just another you know, another, um, you know, in the proof column that other uh, Arab, the Arab world does not care about Palestinians. Um, anyways, 
outside the Middle East, a major international outcry against Israel erupted over the massacres. The phalangists who perpetrated who perpetrated the crime were spared the brunt of the condemnations for it. By contrast, few voices were raised. In May 1985, when Muslim militiamen attacked the Shatila in Burj El Barajne, Palestinian refugee camps, refugee camps, according to UN officials, 635 were killed and 2,500 wounded. So, if we're looking at the timeline here. The phalangist attacks occurred September of 1982. And then in May of 1985, Muslim militiamen attacked the same camps, killing way more, actually, well, a little bit, uh, 635 were killed, but then injuring and wounding 2,500. Uh, 2, no voices raised when the, when the Muslim militia, uh, militiamen did that. Only when Israel does it. By contrast, um, okay, so during a two-year battle between the Syrian-backed Shiite Amal militia and the PLO, more than 2,000, including many civilians, were reportedly killed. Again, yeah, no, not when, Israel, when the phalanges did it under the guise of the Israelis giving them the power. <laughs> it wasn't, well, you said, the reason for the, yeah. yeah, the Israelis said, okay, you think that there's PLO members hiding in the camps, go in route them out the phalanges went and killed whoever they could get their hands on 460 to 800 people 35 of which were just 35 of women and children okay but we don't know the others that were killed that were they were men nothing says there's any proof that they were actual terrorists okay that's what i want to know how many of the other <laughs> less than 35 we're actual terrorists, but we're not going to blame the phalanges. We're not going to have outcry against the people who actually went and behind the back of the Israeli government uh, tricked them and said, okay, we're, we're just going to pull out a terrorist, but they ended up killing uh, lots of people. Not shame on Lebanese phalanges, shame on Israel. And then in 1985, Muslims, a militia, Muslim militiamen, oh my gosh, Muslim militiamen go and attack the refugees camps. They kill 635 and they wound 2,500. Not shame on them at all. Not a, not a word. Not a single word. Not a protest. Then, not an outcry. Yeah. Not an inquiry. A mm -hmm. uh, group set up. Nobody resigned. Not that. Nobody fired. Yeah, no one sanctioned. And then we have a two-year battle between Syrian-backed Shiite Amal militia and the PLO. More than 2,000, including many civilians, were killed. But again, no outcry was directed at the PLO or the Syrians and their allies over that slaughter. International reaction was also muted in October of 1990 when Syrian forces overran Christian-controlled areas of Lebanon. In the eight-hour clash, 700 Christians were killed, the worst single battle of Lebanon's civil war. Outcry, anyone? Seems very one-sided, and it's stupid. It's stupid. So the next um, thing that you can read about is the Kahan Commission of Inquiry on the JewishVirtualLibrary.org website. It is uh, much longer, so we're not actually going to cover it here. Uh, and then, Katie, if you want to read The Lebanon War, 1982, by the Anti-Defamation League, uh, I'll let you read that. Is that very long or no? No, it's pretty, pretty short. And that direct link is um, adl.org slash resources slash, slash glossary dash terms slash the dash Lebanon dash war dash 1982. <laughs> okay. The Lebanon War, 1982, published in 2016, the first Lebanon War was Israel's longest and most controversial war. In the mid-1970s, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, aka PLO, 
broadened its presence in Lebanon, establishing military training centers and escalating artillery and cross-border attacks on civilians in northern Israel. Following the attempted assassination of the Israeli ambassador in London, in London, uh, in, <laughs> I, that wasn't ever pointed out before, in London, Britain, the Is uh, Israel attacked PLO targets in Lebanon in June on June 4th, 1982. The PLO responded with rocket and artillery artillery barrages and Israel retaliated by sending ground troops into Lebanon in a mission titled Operation Peace for Galilee. While the original plan called for Israeli troops to undertake a 25-mile incursion to wipe out PLO positions, in southern Lebanon, Israeli troops on the ground quickly overran the PLO positions, destroyed Syrian installations in the Bekaa Valley, B-E-K-A-A, -A, and reached Beirut by June 9th. After battles in West Beirut, the PLO surrendered and agreed to evacuate to Tunisia in September. On September 16th, Defense Minister Ariel Sharon and Chief of Staff Rafael Etan permitted Israel's Lebanese allies, the Christian Phalangist forces, to enter the Palestinian refugee camps of Sabran Shatila with the purpose of rooting out the remaining PLO forces who had evaded evacuation. The Phalangists, however, brutally massacred Palestinian civilians in the camp. Many Israelis were horrified by the incident, and on September 24th, 400,000 people gathered in Tel Aviv at the first of many demonstrations to protest the Lebanon war. The government appointed Kahan Commission released its reports in February 1983, finding Sharon, quote, indirectly, indirectly responsible, end quote, and concluded that the given well-known phalangist hatred of the Palestinians, he should have anticipated that they were liable to commit atrocities. Sharon resigned as defense minister. In 1983, Israel signed an agreement with Lebanon terminating the state of war between the neighbors. While the PLO state within a state had been dismantled, Syrian troops remained in Lebanon and the Christian-dominated Lebanese government was too weak to control rival factions from attacking each other and Israel. A year later, under pressure from the Syrian government, Lebanon reneged on its agreement and the country remained volatile. Israeli troops completed a phased withdrawal from Lebanon in June 1985 and created a nine-mile-wide security zone in southern Lebanon along the border. The zone was intended to shield Israeli civilian settlements in the Galilee from cross-border attacks and facilitated the capture of many terrorists. However, many Israeli soldiers continued to be killed in the security zone by terrorist groups supported by Iran and Syria, particularly Hezbollah. The high number of casualties incurred in the South Lebanon security zone sparked widespread debate within Israel. In March 2000, the Israeli cabinet voted unanimously for a full troop withdrawal from, the Lebanon, from Lebanon by July of 2000, the same year. The expectation was that such a withdrawal would be a part of an agreement with Syria and Lebanon. However, after Syrian President Hafez al-Assad refused to continue talks with Israel, such coordination was not possible, and Prime Minister Ehud Barak authorized a unilateral withdrawal from Lebanon on May 24, 2000, without any agreement. I say again, Israel remains in the Sheba farm slash Hardov region, which it has held since the 1967-6 uh, day war. The area is recognized by the United Nations as Syrian, not net Lebanese territory, and thus should be the subject of Syrian-Israeli negotiations. Hezbollah insists that it is Lebanese ter territory and frequently attacks Israeli troops in the area as well as along the border and occasionally launches rocket attacks against northern Israeli cities. Not military bases, but cities. Civilians again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one other thing I forgot to mention, there is a Kufi briefing on Hezbollah. It is very long. 
um, but you'll be able to find that on kufi.org. Uh, I actually went to cufi.org and kind of um, can lead you to that. Uh, you'd want to click on the menu and then click on learn. Uh, next, go to, I believe it is read and then click on fact sheets. And uh, under those fact sheets, you can click on security threats and they will outline Hezbollah, Hamas, Iran, incendiary balloon threats, and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Um, and so clicking on Hezbollah, you're going to find a PDF of three pages, but it is uh, a lot of text um, about that. So, um, anyways, that is the end of lesson 15. Uh, I'll post some links after this video so that you can see them if you want to take a quick uh, screenshot of them and go and read and discuss further with your groups. Our next video, which will be video 11, uh, we're going to cover lesson 16, uh, which is the peace process in Antifadas. And if we have time, not sure if we will or not, we'll dive into lesson, lesson 17 as well, which talks about recent challenges. Um, so thank you all for watching, for listening. Um, you know, share it with friends and family, people you want to know this information, people who uh, want to see uh, American citizens and Christians support Israel um, and uh, do what you can to get involved uh, with kufi.org if you're looking to to join Christians United for Israel. Um, Don't let our opinions factor into your opinions. Go to the facts. I told my I tell my children too. Don't go to dot coms. Don't go to Wikipedia. Go to the dot govs dot edu dot orgs. Find newspaper articles, things like that to substantiate and corroborate truths. Okay, and it's not my truth or whatever. It is the truth and only the truth. So go search, find your answers for yourself. Don't base what we say as the where all be all to your own opinions and things you can agree if you want, but only after you, you do the work, you do the thinking, that kind of, kind of thing too. So. Yeah. And I say and, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, um, don't, don't just look at it as a one-sided argument. Um, see, I, of course, we're going to have two different sides of opinion, um, two different, um, you know, from an Israeli standpoint, from your uh, American standpoint, um, and then from, you know, their adversaries. So whether it's Hezbollah or uh, the PLO, um, whatever it is, but do your research. Don't just listen to one person's point of view. Listen to people um, who've been there, who's done that uh, from a civilian standpoint, from a military standpoint, from a government standpoint um, as well. And debate is done with adding more and more factual information. Our, our own opinions can change based on the gathering of more facts, truths, you know? So we are not rigid in our stances either. We may change like, oh, well, we'll rescind that comment or we'll change our viewpoint a little bit on that. And that is okay to say, okay, knowing what we had known, this is how we felt, but now that we know more, we change <laughs> or we can flat out say, oh, we had no clue. We were completely wrong. We apologize that our stances are not rigid and we are not too stubborn to admit when we are wrong as well. <laughs> so that's also an option. Anyways, thank you for watching. Have a great rest of your day or night, wherever you are, and we will see you for our next video. Bye-bye.